Okay. Hold on really quickly. I got this is important, all right? You can just type the answer. You don't have to say it. How old are you? Uh I'm 25. Oh, okay. You got a I'm a woman. I know you don't interact with those regularly, so Um yeah, well, usually when I um when I <laughs> interact with women, they don't sound like 12-year-old <laughs> girls. Um but that's okay. I'm just making sure, you know? There's a lot of young people out there already. Um okay. uh looking to argue. Okay, what did you disagree about? Um fundamentally i guess i would um word it as you don't have a very good grasp of the economics that um it, it's sabine the video was fundamentally just a explainer of that so uh let me check the emails to see what the points i made um yeah i guess i'm just going to start with the first contention i had um at you said uh, that supply and demand is just a natural law of economics and not like a part of capitalism. Yeah, the if, if something is more in demand, people are usually willing to give more for it because there's higher competition to get that thing. But that's been the case for as long as trade has existed. I mean, that's just a feature of trade, not like what? capitalism specifically. Um, The issue with that is there are elements in feudalism such as bonded labor where that systemically prevented the sort of changing of allocation of resources that allowed for supply and demand to naturally come into balance and have an equilibrium price there are forces so for example, that keep equilibrium prices from being met in every economic system including the one we exist in now i'm just saying that as like a a feature of the the way trade functions it's certainly not it's 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 not as though that's something that only applies to capitalism like supply and demand has has guided the way that people price um the stuff that they sell forever well again i'm gonna continue on where i was um things like bonded labor under feudalism that could result in some people ending up some like lords ending up with a way higher supply of labor available to them than would be allocated in a market. So it's just, it's not describable with the hypothetical idea, ideal of what it would be is describable with supply and demand. It's just feudalism didn't have the mechanisms to reach like that equilibrium and capitalism does. I don't, I, this doesn't have anything to do with what I said, so I don't really feel a need to respond to it. It's a um, feature of all economic systems. Uh, we sometimes reach market equilibrium in, uh, in, in, in capital, even then we don't know when we've reached market equilibrium, right? Well, sure we do. No, there's, there's absolutely no way of knowing the answer to that for sure. Cause when there's not a shortage or surplus. That isn't what describes a market equilibrium. It would it, be that's a, precisely what describes market equilibrium. It would be when you've reached a, okay, well then par pardon me if I have the, um, the wrong terminology here, but I was under the impression that an equilibrium on a given price point was when you reached the point that perfectly represented the balance between how much people want the thing and how much of it is available to be given. When uh, you have yes. a perfectly representative and price. That balance is reached through the price rationing mechanism, but the proper quantity and price is when people are willing to sell, when, when the market clears, when the amount being sold is equal to the amount being bought. Yeah, we don't know when we've reached that exact point. And there were points when what we consider that to have been reached would have been reached in the past as well. But there's just, it's, it's, it's too nebulous of a term to know for sure. I would still disagree with that. It's, we can- My, my not... claim was that supply and demand have been features of economic modeling for as long as trade has existed, not just capitalism. And that is an empirically correct claim. So I don't see much of a point in arguing on the specifics of that. I, 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 fine. Whatever. I don't think you're correct because, again, part of what makes supply and demand work is the shifting of resources between, well, in capitalism, it's firms. Under feudalism, it would have been lords or something. Well, so, it's not whether or not it works, it just is. 
if if there's more competition to buy something, then people are going to pay more in order to distinguish their claim for it. But that's not. I I think I've just noticed. Um, you seem to be focusing on like end consumer goods, maybe, but it's also there are labor markets, there are capital markets. Yeah. So um, supply and demand is also about getting those productive resources into the hands of the people who can use them the, bo the most. And again, with feudalism and, and any system that isn't capitalism, you don't get that efficient allocation. Uh, I disagree. Under feudalism, an effort was made to make sure that both the means of production and the resources necessary to make good use of it would be sent to the appropriate fletchers and blacksmiths and butchers and what have you. Um, whether or not you consider it efficient is kind of like a subjective well, assessment. That's, um, I would point you to um, the example of the Black Death um, in 1348. Um, when a bunch of peasants died, all of a sudden they had l more labor negotiation power and they were able to escape from the bonded labor that they were trapped in. And in the immediate years following the Black Death, wages doubled. So they weren't being put to that most efficient, highest and best use. But that happens in capitalism. Yes. Em employment and fluctuates and it can lead to labor shortages or labor surpluses that Again, the things you're describing aren't capitalism specific. This is just how like supply and demand functions. It's it's always going to be the case. Capitalism yeah, okay. isn't about whether or not there's supply and demand. Capitalism is just about whether or not um, you have a class distinction between the bourgeois and the proletariat, one which is associated with relationship to the means of production. It's fundamentally a political relation. You know, the actual mechanics of trade. I mean, look to trade. You can go to China. Hell, you can go to North Korea if you want to. There are plenty of elements of the way in which the economy is managed in North Korea that are capitalistic. They're certainly not feudalistic. The government has control over some of the ways in which they manage their uh, internal trade, but you know that happens within capitalism as well. Protectionist governments can still be capitalistic. But then they're not adhering to the market mechanism. I would I will agree that um, you said that these the supply and demand themselves exist. And I agree, in feudalism, there was a supply and demand, and there was a hypothetical equilibrium point. But again, without the free markets, laborers couldn't go to where they were most needed, and so that equilibrium point wasn't reached because the society didn't have the institutions to enable that. Do you think we live in a capitalist country today, despite the many elements of protectionism, state-run organizations, the fact that we have borders which prevents labor from flowing freely across them, that sort of thing? Um, I would say that there are significant barriers, like exactly what you're talking about, like free immigration. Um, I saw studies indicating that like GD world GDP would increase by literal trillions if we allowed more immigration. So I agree that there are still significant barriers, but I would say that the economy now is more capitalist than not. I, I don't agree that there's a... Um, fine hard distinction point of to the left of this by 0 0.1 capitalisms you're a dirty commie and to the right of this by 0 0.1 capitalisms you're Ayn Rand. All right I agree with that yeah. Um, uh, in that video also um, sorry I, I'm a bit nervous. Um, That's totally okay I don't fault you for that. At about 23 minutes in your video, um, you started talking about it, uh, capitalism itself being a labor exploitation. I've been known to say that, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> it's just a funny way of responding. Um, it's, I, I fundamentally disagree with that because... Well, I agree that, you know, like I said in the bonded labor example, labor can be exploited in that way um, with the removal of a lot of the barriers to free association. Um, employment has become a voluntary contract. So it's a mutual agreement and not an expo exploitation when somebody accepts a job. Could I, um, could I run a hypothetical by you? Is it, sure. Do you know which one I'm going to run by you? 
No. Um, I have a feeling. Okay. Well, stop me if you've heard this one before. If you're on a plane that crash lands in a desert island, and you come to, and you realize that there's only one other person who has survived the crash, they woke up before you, and they have, while you were still asleep, gathered all the coconuts on the island, which they're happy to share with you on the condition that you suck their dick. Would that be a consensual arrangement for you to say yes to this? Uh, yes. Ah, well, I fundamentally disagree, and I think that that's insane of you to say. Um, okay. I would say it's definitely unfair, but it's still consensual. Then your definition of consent is meaningless. You know, you you could have like in a, in the sleep, like on a boat with two people on it, like one person could gather all of the um, like all of the food or whatever, and be like, oh no, in order to get this now, like I'm gonna fuck you, and then it's like, oh well, that's consent. It's clearly not consent. It's definitionally coercion, um, which is not meaningfully consent. I mean, I, this isn't just my definition. The law would agree with me, um, it, that it, by setting up circumstances where a person has no choice but to say yes, you're functionally removing their ability to consent. Okay, but now I, I'm seeing how you're analogizing this labor market. Um, but people do have the ability to not work for an employer. There's nothing stopping you from becoming self-employed as you currently do. Uh, there is actually. If everyone could just become self-employed, they would become self-employed. The economy. Uh, no, doesn't they wouldn't. Yes, they would. The economy doesn't allow for 330 million self-employed people. Necessarily, hundreds of millions of people must abide by traditional authoritarian, you know, capitalist uh, business management. I mean, well, maybe, maybe uh, any individual could get lucky and live free of that, certainly. Um, but obviously, if that was the case, we'd have no businesses or corporations. Nobody would be an employee. But it's mutually beneficial to the employee and the employer to enter into an employment contract. That's why employment at firms still exists. That, and it's mutually beneficial for you and the person with the coconuts. You get the yeah. coconuts and they get their dick sucked. It doesn't make it any more consensual. I, again, with the coconut example, it's consensual but unfair. Well, it's not, just con the law would agree it's not consensual. It's coercive. The conditions have been set up in such a way where you don't really have a choice. You do have a choice. You did it. Well, you could die, but that's not a real choice, is it? That's like saying a person's uh, giving you a real choice when they like put a gun to your head and say your wallet or your life. Like, Vosh, you're self-employed. You did it. You made the choice. Yeah. Do you think that would apply to everyone? Every individual person can attempt to be self-employed yes attempt to but people yeah. have bills to pay and rent to pay and families to feed yeah sure and so meaningfully then the economy is not set up in such a way where this is a meaningful choice if the economy if, if things were set up in such a way that maybe you wouldn't have to suck the dick for the coconuts but one in a group of several people who had just woken up would have to that would still be a coercive system Maybe you can luck out of it and not be the one who actually has to suck the dick, but somebody will have to. And the arrangement there is set up in such a way that some people have to take the fall. We're talking, after all, about a society with billions of people globally. I mean, we're not just talking about any individual rolling the dice on being a YouTuber. As much as that might be fun for that person, like the fact that I did this doesn't change the fact that we're being watched now by thousands of people who are going to have to go to work tomorrow morning. And they can all try to be self-employed. Everyone can try. But obviously, it doesn't work out that way. Well, in the Coconut Island example, somebody has monopolized the resources to becoming a coconut merchant, and that that it just doesn't. That's not a condition that exists in t society today. Sure, it is. No, it isn't. Yeah, with the you means can, of production, you can acquire capital, and you can acquire coconuts. But not everyone can be a member of the bourgeoisie, because being a member of the bourgeoisie is defined by your relationship to the proletariat. There's no proletariat, you can't be bourgeoisie. I, I don't see the point of establishing... There's no... You're not bound into being bourgeois or proletarian. It's a fluid thing that you can change between. 
And yet, the system is set up in such a way that it is virtually guaranteed that the vast majority of people will be workers who work paycheck to paycheck, and a very small minority of people have disproportionate control and power, power which is increasing in, year by year. Do, do you believe in declining marginal benefit of money? Um, I've heard that term used in a few ways. Can you specify? Um, so the idea is, if you're broke, the first $10,000 you earn, that's literally life-changing. Oh, oh, yeah, oh this. Uh, well, uh, yeah, certainly. Money is worth less yeah. the more of it you have. It, again, so we, we agree here. Um, the trade-off that people make when they agree to become self-employed is they can expect to make some amount of money if they try to be self-employed. Maybe they, maybe they have some amount of capital and they can expect to earn a wage of $40,000. And um, but the thing is with self-employment labor is there's a risk to that. Some years you earn a little more, some years you earn a little less. So, what would they do being self-employed? Produce goods and services. As self-employed as as what a street market vendor? Yeah, sure. That's the, an example. The so again the problem I have and this is. This is one of the things that makes me wonder, like, if we're having a real world conversation or if we're having like a you've read a lot of posts and you have strong opinions conversation. Uh, In the real world, the vast majority of people work. They work long, tiring hours, often with no reliable guarantee on their hours or scheduling, and they're not paid very much to do it. The problem that I have with conversations like this, which open with what I consider to be a pretty ludicrous position, the idea that that aforementioned coconut example is not. Uh, one of um, you know exploitation um, is is the idea that like we're we're operating in this fantasy universe where people can just choose to be in different situations. The reality is most people sell their labor for money, and that arrangement is not one that people consent into meaningfully because it's something they have to do to survive. Hell, even if they were self-employed, they would still be workers, would they not? They would be at that point. Um, managing not the exploitation of their boss, but rather the exploitation of the economy of scale and the fact that for the same amount of labor, uh, there are people in the economy who make far, far more. And they can't benefit from that because they're locked out of access to the means of production. They're still a worker. They're just one without a boss, you know? Well, sorry, I was eating. Um, this distinction of that self-employed person still being a worker sure they still perform labor but they're also owning capital it's a simultaneous position of being both and that's why i don't believe that this is a particularly useful dichotomy but um i would you, disagree it, okay um but if i were to continue where i was i'm sorry mm -hmm. um this person who can, uh, with my former example of a person becoming self-employed, if they expect an average income of, again, say 40,000, some years it's 10,000 more, some years it's 10,000 yes, less, um, the years where they earn 10,000 less are, oh shit, I'm going to go fucking broke sort of years, where the years where they earn 10,000 more is just, oh, that's neat kind of years. Whereas if they employ so there's the uh, expected utility of a $4,000 income is lower than the actual utility of a $40,000 income. So it's not so much that they're forced into, you disagree with that? Completely. The premise here has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Well, I'm explaining why somebody would voluntarily enter into a contract. But no, but that's For the, the framing here is what I take issue with. I don't think there is a voluntary. In a system where there is a coercive force that determines the decision to enter into such a contract, I don't believe that it's a... The, the term voluntary contract is a, is a rapist term. It's for rapists. I don't believe in it. What we're really talking about here is social incentives. People are socially incentivized into engaging in certain behavior. And as long as those social incentives exist, as long as their incentives are meaningful as long as they guide people's behavior, they must be treated as forces that operate on us. And if these are forces that operate on us in a way that lead to a very small number of people growing very powerful and the vast majority of people being left in 
poverty and desperation. I think that that must be critically examined. Whether or not they consensually agree is, well, if you want to do that, sure, then the serf consensually agrees the terms of the Lord by living and farming the land. They could leave if they wanted. You know, I, I, I don't believe in this. I don't care whether or not people agree to the cookies on the website and the button down at the bottom. It's about what actually happens. But what is the compulsion? Because with the Lord, they have the force of law. They have, if you don't agree to work for me, I'll fucking kill you. You can leave. Serfs were often given the ability to leave. Admittedly, not in all cases, but um, if they wanted to, there were usually other people who could take up the lands and plots owned by the Lord. I, I'm sorry, I phased out for a moment. Can you repeat that? Uh, serfs were sometimes given the ability to leave. Not in all cases, but um, there were usually enough people who wanted to be able to farm uh, that there were other people, say farmhands, who could take control of the Lord's plot of land should the existing serf leave. Serfs overwhelmingly could not leave. That's the definition of bonded labor. And people overwhelmingly can't just make an income doing self-employment, but we didn't seem to have an issue with that before. And what's more, I mean, even with that not being the case, um, here in the United States today and the world broadly, you are compelled by force of law to make money. Many cities are effectively criminalizing homelessness, and if you don't pay rent, you can be evicted. Um, you have to make money. But most people are not on the verge of poverty. They choose to make money because they want more money, They're not forced because... To. Well, there's a distinction here, Vosh. There's a... The, the US GDP is, what, $70,000 per person? Somebody choosing to make $70,000 a year isn't being forced at gunpoint. So they could easily make $60,000 a year. They have that choice, and that's not a coconut island compulsion. Okay, so, that's not... so, so they don't have a choice. They have to work a job. You're, you're saying, like, well, they could choose to work one job over another. Like, that's still being forced to do something. If someone holds a gun to your head and says, here, choose one of these five candies, you know, like you're still being forced to have a candy. Well, Vosh, yes, people are forced to do something. Well, that's not consensual. I don't, well, I'm sorry, but you can't do literally nothing. Well, why not? Because you'd starve to death. What? Why? Because you're not collecting berries. You're not doing anything. There are other people collecting berries. Okay. And? So there are enough berries. Not necessarily. There are in what the world they, today. What if they berries. do nothing too? Well, what if nobody did anything? Yeah, that that's so, you you're that's you are approaching that extreme. That's what you're saying when somebody choosing to make a little extra money is compelled to or is, is you compare not it to a little extra money not working in the US means a life of desperation and poverty. It's not a superficial choice. Um, you, people choose a quantity of work. People they, you well, no again, I just this this is sort of like the I don't think you've interacted with reality thing. People are working multiple minimum wage gig jobs just in order to make rent, and they're making it with like 60% of their salary. The idea that people are choosing between a lifestyle of base comfort and cosmo cosmopolitan wealth based on how much they're willing to work is just not true. People are struggling to get by. The vast majority of people can't even afford a small emergency of a couple hundred dollars. In the wealthiest that's bullshit, country, and you know it, Vosh. That's not bullshit. It's literally true. You can Google how many Americans can afford a $400 emergency. Those that you know, those stats you see on the internet, they are designed by marketing firms more than anything in order to you, give people wait, a you false impression. Are you denying reality on this? Most people have more than four hundred dollars available in credit. They in have ways credit? in order to handle an emergency. Yes, Everyone, sure. That's not being able to afford a four hundred dollar emergency. That's indebting yourself with an emergency. Very different. But they, they have the purchasing power. No, ah, uh, no, come on. Oh my God, hold on. Are you like a grad student? What are you? You've never worked a job in your life. Yeah, I did. When? This year. The, I the idea that, um, that, oh, you can afford an emergency, just take out more debt, is such an incredibly ass-brained thing to say. 
and with what they're not going to be able to pay that down. if they didn't have the money to pay for the emergency why would they have the money to pay down the debt that will now accrue interest that they use to pay the emergency well clearly the reason that the bank gave them access to that debt is because they believe this person has the ability to they can make That's, changes to their lifestyle that is, uh, you are so out of touch it, the 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 idea that like in the email i i the, your framing was that i am like an out of touch socialist but then your argument to defeater the, the the defeater of like americans being able to afford emergency is okay well could they take out more debt for it this doesn't solve the economic problem i don't i think the problem ultimately is that if your understanding of these issues is determined entirely by this like hyper abstract disconnected from people's real experience um situation uh what's the point of even talking about it like what's your investment in these issues fosh i just um looked online for a little bit the median net worth is one hundred and twenty one thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars according to the federal reserve's 2019 survey of consumer finances mm -hmm. They have, pos they have, that's an enormous amount of value that they can tap into to pay for things. So you realize that that net worth would include their house and their car and their personal possessions, right? So you, wait, do you think net worth is the same as like having money in the bank? Yes. What was the job you worked this year? I worked at Amazon. What position? Fulfillment center associate. Okay. Did you work a job prior to that? Uh, yes. Did it, in any of these jobs, give you an understanding of what net worth means relative to liquid cash? Okay, let me, let me put it this value. way. If I a understand person, that there's If a, a person says, I can't afford to pay my rent, and your response is, sure you can. That furniture you're sitting on right now, you could sell that on the Facebook marketplace and pull together some money. Do you think that's like... Do you think that's an answer that meaningfully addresses the issue that person is having? Yes. It could be a troll, but she could also be like hyper autistic. It's hard to tell. Where'd she go? She probably muted to laugh. That would be the troll answer. No, I'm silent because I'm waiting for a response from you. Well, there's not really a response. It's just a clown answer. Um, you you don't see I I respond the first response that I gave you in email was um I don't know if there's a point to talking about this. It seems like it would mostly be me having to explain stuff to you. I didn't think I would have to explain like the concept of net worth versus liquid income. But okay, Vosh. Again, I'm gonna re, re get so you back to about, reality a little bit. You don't need to bring me back to whatever reality I, you I think clearly you're do. Here. No, Again. it's you're you're not dictating the terms of the conversation. So okay, sorry. Um, in in the context of this. Um, uh, in this reality that you're operating in. Let me try this. Let's let's try to get this a bit more abstract, a little bit more theoretical. Um, okay. I think that society would be best if as many people as possible were happy. Is that is that a, a, a fair sentiment? Can we find some common ground on that one specifically? Yes. Okay. I think that extreme wealth inequality negatively contributes to human happiness in a number of ways. Where are we on that one? Yes. Okay. So, given that, I think that if we have people who are struggling to pay their bills, it is technically true that they could sell everything they have, or that they could, rather than working 40 hours a week, work 60 hours a week, or some other inane thing in order to pay their bills. But when people say, I'm unable to pay my bills, you could, th the appropriate answer to this is not, well, have you considered sucking cock off Craigslist to make a little extra money? Now, technically, this would make you more money. This is a way to boost your income. But the implicit belief when people are talking about this sort of thing is, I'm not able to afford these things, and I should be able to, given the amount of work I do. Because if you're going to say, well, you could just do more work, this is true of all humans on Earth. There is no one alive who could not be doing more work. There's always somebody who could be doing slightly more, right? So it's, it's kind of like a meaningless answer. It doesn't actually give you any 
power to solve or even address these issues. And I'm sorry, what was the question you were asking with that? Well, in, with that being said, with the fact that we're trying to solve these issues, ideally, since we both seem to believe that society would be better if people were happy, do you understand why things like, oh, this isn't a problem, they could just take out debt, or, oh, they could just liquidate their net worth in order to meet like, their bills, doesn't actually fix what we're talking about? So, I would agree in, and disagree at the same time. I'm sorry, let me explain. There are people on the extreme left side of the income distribution that they just don't have very much money, yes. But again, the average person, $121,000, you know, selling their furniture to make rent isn't the average experience of the average person. Yeah, usually when people can't afford rent, they move. And they can move. Okay. So if people are being forced out of their houses because they can't afford them, and these are recent developments changed by shifts in the amount that people are having to pay for rent, would you agree this is a social problem? Because you said earlier that human happiness is a good thing. So now things are happening that make people unhappy. And I would imagine this would then be something we would try to avoid. Yes, that's a problem if people are having trouble affording things. Okay. So do you understand then how saying stuff like, well, they could just sell their furniture, it doesn't, it doesn't see, it, it implies that this is sort of a skill issue, when in reality I, what we're talking <laughs> about is a broad social problem, a shift in uh, resources. I think there's been a slight misunderstanding here. Mm -hmm. um, in the general case, yes, we should expand housing supplies. That way the prices get lower and more people can afford it. Uh, ideally, there's some sort of, uh, again, in, even in the Sabine Hassenfelder video that made me initially message you, she said that there are rules in and things we put in place to help people out. So I agree that we're, those are all necessary. We should have some sort of uh, floor on the income you can earn. But so systemically, yes, I agree. There need to be systemic solutions. But in individual cases, people can make these decisions to this, sell their stuff right. to afford rent. But this is, respectfully, this is a retarded thing to say. In individual cases, anyone could do anything. It's a bullshit way of skating past actual issues. Like, in individual cases, you could say anything about anything. You could say, oh, well, in an individual case, I think that, like, well, here's a list of, like, 57 things. Sell your blood plasma, whatever. Obviously, there's always something a person can do, or in many cases, there's something a person can do. But if the goal here of the conversation is to produce good social outcomes, and you're suggesting things which, if done broadly, would bring about bad social outcomes, you're sort of avoiding the problem and wasting time. Like, I don't but understand what exactly the point is of trying to argue the idea that people can get by if they just go on credit when they can't afford their bills or when there's Vosh, an emergency I, that pops up. Can, can I repeat myself? Um, again, yes, there are necessary social reforms we need to do. Mm -hmm. We need some sort of floor to make sure people always make above a certain minimum income. I, I'm 100% in support of that. And given that, you know, the, the US GDP is $70,000, we have the resources to be able to do that. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. And so when you frame me as being this psychopathic, I don't give the slightest shit about the poor sort of person, it's a dishonest thing to say. Well, you did say it would be consensual for a person to steal all of your food sources and then say that the only way they would offer you any is if you perform sexual favors for them. That is a very weird answer to give. Again, it's unfair, but consensual. So I, the, the, I don't so, think we should allow un, I don't think we should allow these unfair. Again, this this is a dilemmas. point where it's not just me. Like the law disagrees with you, and the reason I'm repeating this is because I think often when I make these arguments, I get framed as some kind of idealistic commie. But in reality, like I, th I think like a lawyer. Like if you asked a lawyer that. They would be like, what? That's not consensual. Like, I, I feel like I'm taking the normal position here and you're taking some kind of hyper distanced, like, um, 
economic real like like some 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 sort of heavily online position but it doesn't matter ultimately you know if we believe that social changes should be made for the better i mean shit that's why i'm a socialist so um with that in mind were there any other technical inaccuracies you saw in my video on sabine hausenfeld uh yes thank you for asking um you said a lot about um the suggestion Sabine Hosenfelder made to uh, price pollution instead of your suggestion of locking people up. And I fundamentally think that Sabine's position of some sort of pollution tax is a better solution. Um, yeah, I think tax is fine. I think that if people break uh, rules that are set, they should be sent to jail. Um, the main issue that I had was the... Um, the carbon trading schemes. It seems that conservatives don't like the idea of framing it as a tax. I think that a tax would be, in most cases, the best possible solution. I think that the, you know, arrests would be like a very specific sort of thing. But like in instances, for example, where illegal dumping is found, so often companies get away with a fine. Flagrant violations of rules like that should be met with prison time, not with fines. Well, it, I mean, Sure, if there's a hard and fast rule, the penalty should be more than a fine. Yeah. People and involved should pay some real penalty. But with pollution, for example, um, we've had it be extremely effective in reducing pollution by pricing things like sulfur dioxide emissions. And that has led to, again, a huge improvement of standards of living. And in the video, at least, you seemed to be a lot more apprehensive towards this tax approach. Yeah, I think, um, chat, I got a couple of emails about this where they were talking about me conflating um, carbon credit trading with carbon taxing and a few other things. I think I stand by a lot of what I said. I think I would have, if I could go back and remake that video, I would have been more specific that I like the idea of a carbon tax. The issue that I have is with the credit system because it seems like that gets exploited pretty pretty ruthlessly, um, and it makes uh, businessmen rich, which which of course I cannot abide. Uh, but yeah, no. O overall, I I think my my issue with the arrests is it wouldn't be like arresting you know one year in prison for every ton of carbon produced or whatever. Um, more along the lines of flagrant rule violations, which happen pretty often. You know, when corporations get fines for ecological. Um, mismanagement. It's not exactly a super uncommon phenomena. And um, it, no one ever gets arrested for this, even though people yeah, like, like, willfully um, decide to ruin the environment for their own personal gain. You're, you're right that people get away with it. I remember a couple years ago, there was some Swedish dickhead who bought like a thousand acres of Amazonian land claiming to be wanting to prote protect the land. And then he, um, he was caught um, doing illegal deforestation there. And the fact that he got away with that when there are protections against the illegal de deforestation in the Amazon is unconscionable, but it's a fundamental difference to say that when people break the rules, there should be a penalty versus what that penalty, what the rule and should be in the first place. Um, sure. Well, that's very like specific stuff. I mean, EPA guideline you know, EPA guideline technicalities um, are obviously require a lot of technocratic knowledge. I wouldn't pretend to understand enough to specify what rules I think there should be. Only that I know that under existing rules, corporations break them quite often with very little in the way of penalties. Okay, then. So um, reviewing this, we're broadly in agreement that a carbon pricing system or pricing for other sorts of pollution is more or less an effective solution here? Yeah, I think a carbon tax seems to do pretty well. Even the carbon trading has some limited utility, but I don't, I don't like it. Um, and of course we should arrest some people. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I'm glad we could resolve that misunderstanding a little bit there. Um, yeah. Uh, later in the video, you talked about um, worker co-ops a bit. Love those. Um, explain why that would be better than just having a 401k. I don't, they're not really in the same category. I guess we could well, have sure. a 401k. People really sure want to. Sure they are. To. 
and they're mutually exclusive too. A worker co-op is having equity in your own company. A 401k is having equity in the broad basket of all companies in the economy. Oh, sure. Well, I, I don't believe in stock trading. So I suppose, I mean, if you, by, by 401k, I assumed you meant like broadly a, a mechanism for investing into retirement. If that was to exist, then, you know, sure. I don't think that stock trading should be a thing. Um, as for a worker cooperative, I'm not so much interested in equity uh, as I am the worker democracy, uh, because I think that worker cooperatives could also essentially function in a, in a, a government-run institution, which, of course, would not allow for equity. It's publicly owned. Um, but would rather just be a matter of internal control. Uh, though, obviously, for private firms, you know, the equity is implied. So if it's government owned and there's no equity from the workers, in what sense is that even a worker cooperative? The democratic element. Management would be elected in those cases. Of course, we can't have people working at, like, the post office, collect collectively own the post office. You know, the whole point of a government-run institution is that it stays as such. And... Um, in that case, what we'd be gunning for is democracy. Probably very strong sectoral unions as well. I mean, there's lots of stuff that you could do to protect people in those positions without giving them literal equity. But then what's the benefit to the worker if they don't have any equity in the firm that they work in of a cooperative like that, other than just, oh, they get to do more work of managing the company? I don't, why is that good? Um, be, well, the occasional meeting to elect their management isn't that much more work, but I think that democracy is worth its own, uh, is its own reward, effectively. Um, I think that in a worker democracy, the management is much more likely to not be a gigantic asshole because they know that they're directly accountable to the workers below them, where no such mechanism functionally exists in traditional autocratic workplaces. Um, we do have research on people in worker cooperatives, and it seems that for the most part, they have better experiences and much higher opinions of management. So in line with that, you know, I think that that could be applied in pretty much any workplace. And people have a right to control their workplace, of course. Okay, but a market and rules can achieve similar outcomes, and it achieves it for more than just individual workplaces. It achieves it on a broad scale. No substitution for democracy. So it's more of an ideological disagreement with the very concept of people not electing their management. It's not like a income base. It's not like a people are being exploited argument that you're making for these worker co-ops. Authoritarianism is naturally exploitative. Call me socially liberal. I think the democracy should be a given. I don't think I should even have to make a case for it, frankly. People have a right to enfranchisement in the states that they live in. Likewise, I think that people should have control over the businesses they work in. And it does lead to better outcomes. You know, theoretically, you could achieve all of the positive downstream outcomes of a democracy under a monarchy. You could be like, oh, well, we don't need a democracy to get all these positive things. You don't want a democracy in and of itself. You want all the things you think you'll get from a democracy. Well, you could get that from like a benevolent monarchy, but we don't, do we? Right? You know, technically, Kim Jong-un uh, could just do all of European social democracy, but that wouldn't make it a social democracy, and he would never do it either. Um, democracy is the best mechanism for ensuring the rights and beliefs of the workers are uh, taken seriously. But they can do that at the ballot box today via proxy of regulation, via getting the p party they want, the Democratic Party, into office. How will that make their manager less of an asshole? By passing a law what the government does. An anti-asshole manager law? Well, I'm saying you can illegalize certain labor practices that are characteristic of being a dickhead. Sure, do that too. So if... there's, there's no reason to believe, like, first of all, the amount of government bloat that would be introduced in trying to have all of the regulatory mechanisms and agencies necessary to determine whether or not all these standards would be met Ridiculous. Why not just give them democracy? It's the easier well, solution by far. I mean, it's 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 less costly to the taxpayer because you wouldn't need like 50 federal agencies to determine whether or not your boss is being an asshole in one of any number of ways. You could just let these organizations run themselves. And it's organization uh, operation at the local level, which is good, I think, especially when it comes to interpersonal stuff. Um. Okay, so you made a good point there. Um, I would agree that there is a local knowledge problem that 
central government just can't have access to all of the information of every single workplace to make sure that everybody's, you know, has a good manager. But that's the reason why we have things like the NLRB and individual unions that can negotiate for that even without being a worker co-op. Why not just make it a worker co-op? Because that prohibits the free trading of stocks. Who cares? Great. Good. I want that. I want that. Yeah. People who make their money off of stocks are literally making their money off of nothing. They contribute no labor. They hire people to invest and reinvest their wealth. Occasionally, they may make direct investment decisions, but for the most part, it's just a way for a small group of people to exert ungodly control over the economy from a distance while contributing, inventing, or developing nothing on their own. I don't want stocks as a concept. And the world got along just fine before stocks. I don't, I don't believe that they're even necessary to manage the investment problem in, uh, in modern economies. I think it's very possible to do this through a wide variety of systems of wealth allocation, um, of, of, of government grants. I, I like the idea that the only way for corporations to get off the ground is through the stock market is total BS. There are tons of companies that get really big while private, and then, then they go public, and it's not always the public good, right? I mean, oftentimes when they go public, it means that a small group of investors get big, but it doesn't meaningfully improve their product or the quality of their services. It's just how they make their money. Some people are able to scale their company without, you know, an IPO, but the ability to hold and buy and sell stocks is a part of the allocation of capital resources. Well, you know how and I it, feel about that. Uh, no, I don't. About capital? Yeah. I don't like it very much. I think it's kind of cringe, personally. So you don't like... Uh, I, I'm sorry, this um, sounds absurd to me. Um, define capital. Uh, capital, currency used uh, for reinvestment into the consolidation, improvement, development, whatever, of the means of production. Not just currency. Labor vouchers, for example, wouldn't be capital. Uh, but I don't like that. I mean, I I'm, I'm, I'm not a capitalist. I don't like that. I think that there are very strong negative downstream effects to allowing for its existence. And not only because it uh, facilitates the existence of the bourgeoisie as a class, uh, but also, maybe even more importantly, because the existence of capital is essential to the, um, the uh, 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 tendency for capital to accumulate, for wealth to be held in the hands of a smaller and smaller group of people. Because the people with access to larger amounts or portions of the means of production have access to more capital, which they can use to consolidate further and further we have fewer banks and companies in this country every single year as mergers, um, you know, uh, draw the pool down and a smaller and smaller number of people control everything. I'm sorry, my headphone disconnected for a second. Can you repeat like the last 15 seconds? I think that capital as a, uh, a, a form of accumulated wealth leads to more power in the hands of a smaller number of people, which I think is cringe. Okay, so... Um... Starting at the beginning of your where you defined capital, I just don't think at all that's an appropriate definition to use of capital. It's a Marxist definition. I'm aware there well, are multiple. Okay, I don't think it's a particularly useful definition for any context beyond understanding Marx. I do like understanding a, Marx. Well, then, understanding Marx as a historical figure is one thing, but Currency used for reinvestment would be the simplest definition. I think that's a fine distinction. There are forms of currency that can't be used for reinvestment, for example. Okay, I would um, use a wildly different definition of capital, of goods and services used in the production of other goods and services. Well, that's fine. If that's the definition of capital that we're using, then it can exist. But this is literally a semantics uh, distinction, is it not? I mean, my concern here is about um, getting rid of Wall Street. The, the point of this is when you say you're against capital, what I hear is you're against the use of goods and services to produce other goods and services. That's like being against the shovel as an invention. That's uh, you, you understand why 
when you initially said you're against capital, I thought that was insane, right? By your definition, sure. Though, of course, okay. if I'm an anti-capitalist, you know, there has to be some definition of capital that I don't get along with, right? Okay, so... I'm going to continue using definition of capital that I outlined. So when I say that stocks are important in the, re in the allocation of capital resources, I mean the ability to buy and sell stocks is a fundamental aspect that is important in allocating capital to where it is most beneficially used and I therefore ma making society wealthy. I don't think that it... Um puts capital towards where it's most necessary to be used. I think that the Wall Street and stocks in general are a constant 24-7 shit show where games are played by very wealthy people to make a lot of money uh, for doing nothing. I do not think that this in any way meaningfully correlates towards uh, responsible social investment. In fact, I'm pretty sure the data on this does side with me um, because the, um, the relationship between like activity within the stock market and capital and investment I don't know how much of a correlation there is towards like innovation, increase in product quality or anything of that sort. It seems like it's just a lot of money shifting hands between very wealthy people. And that's not even like a controversial position or anything. That's just like how it's played. Um, I want uh, markets, economies and businesses to be more local. I want them to remain, well, not private, of course, but in the hands of the workers who actually work there. I don't want everything to be controlled by a small group of transnational corporations that have no allegiances other than to their own bottom lines. Um, and I don't think what I'm asking for here is, is, is crazy either. There are plenty of like mainstream liberal economists who have laid out critiques of the way uh, capital allocation works in our current system. And we have plenty of examples of it being done uh, in, in other ways that are effective. Government grants or local grants would be a pretty good way of handling things on local levels, I think. Um, when it comes to a small worker cooperatives, you know, uh, people can either front up the cash to begin with, or I mean, you know, shit, maybe, um, maybe like there can be like a city or county level effort to, um, to, uh, hand out grants for local businesses to certain plots of land. So what I'm going to, um, respond to that with is that. I, I can understand how you can see Wall Street and think, oh, that's a shit show. And to be fair, it kind of is. Um, it's just that the what you're observing there is the secondary stock market. It's, um, it's an important aspect to make the primary stock market function, but companies sell equity in order to get the money in order to buy the capital to produce more and better things. And they will no longer, yeah. But then how will they acquire that? I don't think... And how will there are plenty of companies that manage to um, that manage to build themselves up without like selling equity. They can they can take out loans like a normal human would have to. They can benefit from grants if they can make a case for it. The problem is the moment you open up the opportunity for selling equity, you create the bourgeoisie all over again. And how could you not? Right? You're literally giving ownership of the company and a portion of its profits over to someone who doesn't work there. This is an unacceptable outcome. There are ways of managing this, you know, the idea of um, financing cooperatives. I mean, cooperatives have money, after all, without selling their equity. It's possible. It can be done. And when there is no alternative, I think you'll see a much better set of social outcomes as well. No longer will all of the good parts of your town be ruined as they're brought up by transnational corporations, then sold and left to dust. You'll have CEOs no longer jumping off the companies they control with golden parachutes. You will bring the economy back down to what it should be, a human level. And I think that everyone could stand for that. I mean, look at the hollowing out of middle America and hell, even coastal America at this point. Uh, as shop after shop after shop after shop after shop closes, everything unique and individual about a neighborhood dies. And meanwhile, you know, you have this theoretical economic benefit brought about by the low prices of Walmart or Target, what's the actual consequence? People in the area get poorer because there's no longer any money circulating. So, um, again, starting at the beginning of your response, um, sure, some, some companies have been able to scale without selling equity or without selling bonds, but that's overwhelmingly the exception. And there are some companies that weren't able to scale. What you're seeing is a selection bias there. The ability to 
again, be able to sell your stock in order to get more money, in order to buy more capital is an important aspect of discovering which firms are the most productive. Productive by what definition? Uh, in terms of the value of the outputs being greater than the value of their inputs. Um, okay, I don't care. Are they valuable so, to their community? Are they providing something of value to the people who actually manage them? Because the idea that there's a positive correlation between the stock market indexed price of a company and how much social good they do is ludicrous. Quite the opposite, in fact. I think there's it's, it's essentially a zero correlation game. In fact, I would say there's inverse correlation. The average person day to day, I would be willing to bet, derives more enjoyment and more pleasure from the existence of local businesses that do not in any way have any shot of making it onto a listing. Now, of course, I'm not denying the need for broad corporations, for supply chains, for what have you, for such and such. For very large things that need to be done, um, you know, I support decommodification. Let the biggest corporation of all, the government, handle it. Already democratic, at least ostensibly. And for things that want to be kept private, I think that it's perfectly possible to manage these supply chains without uh, leaning on the idea that it can only be done through capital reinvestment. So you say this, you're, you don't give a shit about productivity and... Of course I do. But well, you, you... stock market index price is not productivity. Y yes, um, so sorry if I gave that impression that that's what I... The value of... When I say the value of the outputs being greater than the value of the inputs, I mean when you have $20 worth of goods and services being produced using $1 of labor and $1 of capital, that's good. When you have $10 of labor and $10 of capital producing $5 of goods and services, that's a net social loss. That's Why? bullshit. No, it's not. The money, that went to, the money that went to labor went in the hands of workers. You think that's money lost. That's money gained. It's not inefficient to pay your workers more because those workers are the one who, ones who buy the products. This is how Walmart hollowed out middle America. Sure, they offer their products for cheap, but they don't pay shit either and all the money leaves the community. Back in the day when you had a bunch of small businesses in a town, were people poor on average in terms of their ability to buy stuff like in a broad economic, you know, distant sense? Sure they were, for sure. It was less economically efficient, but the money was kept in the community and people were paid more proportionally by the jobs they worked, so they could go out and buy more. But what happens when you buy something from Walmart when you live in the middle of West Virginia? Well, the money goes to Walmart, and that just ends up sitting in some gigantic dragon's vault somewhere in the Walmart family fortune. You know, it, it, it doesn't go back in the community. But if you buy stuff from a local business, even if it's more expensive, that money then goes in the hands of the local businessman who then turns around and spends it at the local shops. And that money from the local shops enriches the community and allows them to pay their employees more. And that's how small town America has died over the past 70 years, you know? You think of labor costs a loss, and that's how any capitalist would think. But in reality, that thinking is what's destroying this country. Okay, but the reason I say that this productivity is important and all of that is when you are, when you are producing less with more resources, that's less for less less goods and services for everybody to enjoy. And that's what ultimately decides the material abundance that people have to live in. And if yet, you're making cool. if you're making thirty thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars and you're only producing tiny amounts of shit, you're just gonna pay thirty thousand dollars to have a tiny amount of shit. I don't I don't agree with the idea that capital investment through stocks and equity ownership has allowed for this massive breakthrough in productivity. I think that the size of corporations corresponds to this to an extent, but I do not think it's like this. It, capital investment unlocks this higher tier of productivity. But what's more, again, productivity isn't everything. Walmart is enormously economically productive, but it bankrupts and ruins communities that it, um, that it sets up in. So clearly we're looking for the wrong metrics here, or at least we're looking at an incomplete picture. Well, Walmart also disperses its ex uh, extra revenue to the people who produce the goods and services that it sells and to the uh, investors. Ooh. I don't care about the investors making money. I don't give a single oh, shit. Oh, okay, so then Walmart disperses the money to the people who make the goods and services it sells. Who? To the 
you know, to to the one million Chinese laborers who are manufacturing the shit they sell. Oh yeah, they're making lots. Work in, mm -hmm. They're making a lot more than they would. No, they're not. They could be working on industry uh, that benefits their own country. The idea that Walmart is making efficient use of its economy ruining standards because there are Chinese sweatshop workers out there barely making a living in China is ridiculous. You 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 you're an ideologue. You have an ideological investment in defending this, but the consequences of Walmart's behavior on America, this is not just a lefty proposition. There are tons of liberal economists who have wrote on this. Everyone thought that the, uh, you know, the economy of scale would, would, would lift America out of poverty because everyone would have a Walmart and now go to those Walmarts and everything around there is dead. And these towns have been bleeding population, you know? And then it's like, oh, well, it's all for the good of the Chinese. What we're, you know what? I'll be a nationalist here. I don't give a f They can work on their own shit. I don't, I don't think, I, I will not uh, abide the hollowing out of this country on the imagined belief that the sweatshop laborers are benefiting from it. America so, first. Um, why do you hate the global poor? I don't hate the global poor. And this is a bullshit argument. The countries that have ro risen up and become wealthy the fastest are the ones that engaged in protectionist policy and didn't allow themselves to be cucked out by Western industry. This has also been empirically demonstrated. The idea that these countries are benefiting, like China, the Chinese workers are benefiting from the state of affairs is not the case. You know, if you want to see countries that have completely given themselves over to Western investment, go to like half of Africa. Yeah, they're doing great over there. Meanwhile, over here in America, we have a separate system where we recognize there's value in local manufacturing, local jobs, local industry. But then when it comes to them, it's like, oh, yeah, well, shouldn't they be thankful that they get to do our slave work? You know, nah, fuck that. We, we directly aid and abet the uh, worker exploitation of the Chinese Communist Party by allowing them to get away with this, uh, this bullshit. So I fundamentally disagree it that, doesn't matter if you disagree it's you're incorrect on this one uh okay i was going to say i fundamentally disagree with the facts that companies that isolate themselves from the global financial system have developed fast faster what what about the east asian tigers what about like singapore south korea and stuff countries that engage in protectionist mechanisms so they can develop their own industry before being bullied out by western businesses because if they compete with Western businesses right off the get-go, they'll lose every time, right? So you'd think the right answer here would be, oh, they should open up the market to Western business because the local consumers would benefit from being able to get all these cool, cheap Western goods. But then it's like, well, wait, hold on a second. Where does the money go if everyone's buying foreign goods? It goes out of the country and then everyone's poor again. And this is what's happened in country after country after country. Look at countries that like have all these Western imports. They're not doing good. So what you are doing is you're making the infant industry argument that, you know, countries starting out with, you know, some industry should introduce protectionist barriers to make sure that their industries develop. Um, but the thing is, that's not really whatever happens. It's the the infant industries, the you know the small companies that could hypothetically benefit from these protectionist barriers. They don't have the political sway in order to get these countries to institute these protectionist barriers to protect them. It's the large major companies that are challenged by these infant industries that overwhelmingly have the political power to, to raise these protectionist barriers. Why would being why would a why would a country why, why would a company being challenged by smaller domestic industries then use that as a justification for protectionist policies? That, that makes no sense. Can you rephrase that question? I don't understand the point. I don't understand You're... the point. Why, wh the, the, I, I, this isn't, I, I think this is a distraction. The influence that protectionist policies have had on the development of countries that managed to break free of the sweatshop side. There's a reason why China has sweatshops and South Korea has a functioning economy that's closer to parity with us. Because not long ago, they were in basically the same spot. And it's because they took different paths. They made different decisions. So again, this is all a bullshit um, distraction from the point. No, we don't need capital reinvestment in the way that you describe for industries to flourish. And no, I don't hate the global poor for suggesting they should be able to have something better than sweatshops. Um, the economy is more complicated than that. And very often you want things to be contained at a local level 
in order to increase not only productivity, but the circulation of currency internally. You also want to keep money out of the hands of the wealthy. All the wealthy do is store it. They don't spend it. And money that's stored is bad for the economy. The trillions held in the um, you know, offshore accounts the Panama Papers revealed would be enough to usher the world into a new economic age. But wealthy people are demons, so they keep it to themselves. Um, I think, uh, I, I think we really need to refocus our economic analysis on a local level because that is where economy happens, you know, day to day, middle class people going and buying and saving and storing. That's what economic activity is. Not a bunch of fat cat investors greedily exchanging, you know, uh, equity so they can uh, store more money in the Bahamas. So what I believe is that you are getting... <sighs> You have a bit of tunnel vision. Um, money isn't what matters at all. It, it, the money is just a unit of measurement. Like for example, the United States is running a gigantic trade deficit right now, but the U.S. isn't becoming any poorer for that. Even though you know green slips of paper are coming up, but we're getting real goods and services that contribute to the standard of living of Americans in exchange. I don't know what this has to do with what I said. So what when you say that this local circulation of money is what matters and what keeps economies no that's wrong. I wait hold on I genuinely don't feel like you have any knowledge with which to speak on this. There is no relationship whatsoever between the statement that economic activity happens on the local level with the exchange of goods and services and the fact that the United States can run a trade deficit without it leading to significant negative outcomes. Things work differently between a nation and individual economic like microtransactions. I mean, obviously, America is the institution that prints the currency. It has a different kind of control over the worth of the currency, especially when it comes to trade. I, I, feel like, I feel like a lot of what you've been saying lately is a kind of deflection. If you have a fundamental issue with the reallocation of wealth, then speak to that. But don't pretend that I hate that. Don't be a coward. Don't pretend that I hate the global poor, because I don't think that we should be maintaining an interminable relationship of sweatshops um, between us and China. Like, don't don't pretend that I don't understand like the you know the uh, uh, debt and and global capital because I think that the economy should be understood as like a a, a local uh, force you know I'm I'm speaking primarily here I feel from analysis that I've done of largely liberal economists the problem is that liberals are cowards they're spineless they're weak blooded um, and they don't take these things to their logical conclusions. We see a billion problems emerging from one group of people, the bourgeoisie. So what do we do with them? Well, clearly, they have to be legislated out of existence. And that's everything that I argue for. So you said it yourself when you were discussing China versus South Korea. Not long ago, they were in the same position that Korea was just like China having a bunch of sweatshops. The difference here is that not the protectionist industries is that or protectionist measures, it's that Korea had better social institutions in order to be able to contribute to a better and more innovative economy that let them, once they had money, use that to develop even more productivity. That's what led to them ga gaining So they were more wages. innovative. Yes. Um you you, the, you realize this is bunk, right? You didn't even respond to what I just said. Can you repeat the contention you had that you would like me to respond to? Uh, the entire thing that I ranted? No, I'm afraid you're going to have to rely on your memory for that one. Um, no, the idea that two countries could take wildly different economically or wildly different economic paths purely because one country was more innovative than another is not the case. I mean, Korea was fascist back when it started making these protectionist policy policy decisions. It's not as though they were. Um, politically in that much better of a place than China was at the time, they chose a different strategy. Rather than being the factories of the world, they focused more on uh, their own development, and it ended up working out much better for the people of Korea. Uh, Korea focusing on being the factory of the world is exactly China. what led them to where they are today. China focused on being the factory of the world. And Korea did too. I I do not, when I say factory of the world in reference to what China is doing right now, there is no country ever that competes with that. I don't think you could fairly say they did that. Well, Korea has a large amount of exports because 
they literally mandate companies have a certain amount of revenue from external sources. That's why there's all these Hyundais and all these Samsung phones in the US. It's because that's what led to the innovation. Do you know what they, led to them being able to develop those industries? Having enough money in order to do that? It was them banning imports of competing products so they had the ability to develop them internally. Those industries would have never developed if they had immediately just brought in Western goods because there would have been no room. There would have been no market space to compete with our massive manufacturing abilities. They were protectionist. I disagree. It's you. Okay, then I'm going to read this. In the early read 1970s, what? third five-year plan focused on heavy and chemical industries. Hence, new engine of growth shifted from light manufacturing to heavy manufacturing. Meanwhile, South Korea continued with its export promotion and import restriction policies. The production of automobiles began while imported cars virtually disappeared from the market. The increase in exports was roughly 45% a year. So you talk about their cars. Well, the reason that we know about their cars, about their tech, is because they restricted imports. They allowed protectionist policies to develop their industry. But the industry developed because they had a comparative advantage in that field. Argentina also tried import substitution industrialization, and they did not get the same outcome. Doesn't always work, but it doesn't change the fact that in South Korea, all of the industries that we now recognize them for were developed because they, the government kept them from competing with our industry. It's because they had the correct institutions and educated and innovative so, populace. So this is, and again, that comparative advantage. Spineless. That's the deciding factor. They engaged in protectionist policies and it allowed so them to So did Argentina. Their, yes, I'm not saying that policies work out all the time. I am saying that these, and it's not just South Korea either. We can take a look at the, um, the, 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 South, or the, uh, the East Asian tigers. You know, this is a pretty consistent trend with them. Um, it sounds to me like you're just like, you're putting your fingers in your ears. You're doing na 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 na. The idea that protectionism allowed them to build their industries, this is, again, not a controversial position. See, the so, problem that I often have when I talk about economic stuff is that I want to be the crazy commie. I want to sit here and ramble about Marx and workers. But so often, defending the current status quo requires a level of ignorance, which means you can't even have engaged with liberal economic critique either. Like, it, it, in, in order to, like, I don't even get to the second order stuff. I have to be like, okay, well, can we acknowledge the fact that, you know, many Americans can't afford, like, an emergency? And no, going on credit doesn't solve that problem. No, we, 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 ha we have to acknowledge that there was a different economic path taken for China than for South Korea. Like, I don't even get to do the commie rambling, which is, you know, something I generally enjoy doing. I said that I would just be explaining stuff to you, but I don't think you care about this. I, 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 I feel like this is a distraction. Do you have an so, ideological bias towards these inequitable outcomes? Like, why argue this? So, I want to remind you of the difference between dependent and independent variables. There if, are if you're, tons of... If you're seriously going to pretend that there isn't a ton of research and, um, and engagement with the idea that protectionism can be beneficial for the development of industry in smaller countries, like, there's not really a point in having this conversation. I, the only thing I can really say is, like, I don't know, read like basic econ stuff. Th th this isn't like a me thing, you know? I'm not dying on this hill and it's not my job to go over stuff like this. I don't think you're unintelligent or maybe you're trolling or something, but like you, this is very, it's very easy to not have these opinions, you know? I want you to take a look at the uh, mean weighted tariff rate of various countries and, and see still, if there's any correlation. You're not, you're, no, see, there's, there's this no, is there's This no is what point. defines protectionism. The, these no more point. protectionist countries aren't on average wealthier. We're not talking You're... we're not talking about national wealth. China is wealthier than South Korea for one. We're talking about the median uh, GDP per person um, when which South Korea is certainly outperforming China. For two, if you were to do this on a country by country basis, you know, obviously uh, characteristics would determine uh, or would would sway massively. I think that uh, if a country is really poor to begin with, I don't think there's much of a chance in either case. Like if, if, if like, I don't know, Sri Lanka or, well, not Sri Lanka, I don't know, if Sudan decided, ah, oh, we're going to do protectionism to build builder industry, I don't think it would make that much of a difference because Sudan is a poor shithole anyway. Like the country is so mega f***ed in so many different directions that it's difficult. 
it's 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 difficult to like understand if any or like what set of economic changes would lead to those kinds of conclusions you know like what, what do you want to get those outcomes i have no idea when it comes to sudan but that doesn't change the fact that and, and the only reason we're talking about this right now is because you disingenuously accused me of hating the global poor because i said that i don't think walmart is good for america a position almost so ubiquitously held by economists today that they're practically screaming about it in their papers. The idea that Walmart has not led to this massive like increase in, in, in living standards for Americans. Like all of this is a tangent to another point that you disingenuously argued. So I, so I don't I don't care for it. You can read up on protectionism if you like. I stand by my positions. They will not sway in this conversation, certainly. Can I make one comment? If it's to this, you can, but I won't engage with it. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it is to this. I would recommend that you read um, The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets by Thomas Philippon, and it makes exactly the opposite argument about Walmart that you just made. It's it, When you actually look at it, Walmart, yes, has led to this lower prices, more material abundance for Americans effect. And yet wealth inequality is higher than ever and people can't afford their rent or an emergency or their bills. Sure, but there's other systemic factors in the economy. Walmart no, oh, oh so, so, so ones that I don't care about. This is always how it gets around, you know? It's always that, well, hey, everyone agrees that things are materially worse and all these, like, all these analyses show things are materially worse. And then it's like, ah, well, by this really abstracted, inhuman definition that we've come up with, actually things are better than ever. Oh, well, thank you. You know, the people of America, thank you for your... Um, your engagement with their with their real issues. What is materially worse from forty years ago? I just talked about these things. You wait, you you realize that like in terms of the ability to afford a house, in terms of like average rent costs, in terms of like proportional value of income with the minimum wage not rising with the uh, GDP and with productivity, on on there are so many levels in which the economy is worse than it used to be. Sure, goods are cheaper, but the fundamentals proportional to our income are certainly relative to the economic growth that we've seen, not catching up. This is why when you say you think some systemic changes would be good or beneficial, I think you're lying. You know, this is what everyone says, like the Republicans say this. Oh, you know, I think we need real meaningful change to fix our economy. And then what changes do they offer? They want to lower the marginal tax rate on businesses. Like, oh, oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You've really solved the problem. But you can't even acknowledge the problem. Flash, I do not appreciate it when you accuse me of lying. Uh, okay. So, what I'm going to say is that, sure, yes, the, peop the fact that people are struggling to afford housing is bad. But again, that's zoning policies that are leading to a housing shortage. Mm -hmm. That's not Walmart. Uh, well, Walmart drained these communities of wealth. Again, I'm, I'm, so I don't, I want to be a lefty, but like I'm arguing liberal shit with you. The, listen, this is a fact, okay? Do you, do you, okay? Do you know about Black Wall Street? Yes, Tulsa, Oklahoma, firebombed. Right. Okay. What was their strategy for keeping wealth in the community? To own the means of production themselves. Um, to shop at black-owned businesses. Effectively, yes. To well, on a on a micro scale at least, to shop at black owned businesses so that when black men made black money, they could go to a black business in their black neighborhood and keep it all in neighborhood. Because the problem they kept running into is even if all of these people went out and they um made money and brought it back home to their black household, they would then spend it on uh taxes, on on, on property and income taxes that went to white governments. They would spend it on goods at white-owned stores that would go to white people. And shortly, all the money would leave the black community, not be reinvested, and then kablammo, they're back as poor as they were before. So they decided to start shopping in the black community, and it worked. Likewise, what Walmart did was it, it, it undid that process all over America. You had all these Midwestern towns that relied almost entirely on local business. Not entirely, but mostly. And then they all get their big box store, and the big box store might employ a lot of people at first, and it might offer cheaper goods, you know, but it doesn't pay very much. And when money goes into Walmart, it doesn't go back into the community. It just goes into the broad transnational capitalist hands that own the place. And 
as a consequence of this, it leads to uh, money being siphoned out. That money doesn't get reinvested. This is not like a lefty, like crazy crackpot lefty thing. This is this is what happened. It's a well studied phenomena. So you've said a couple times you want to go on about crazy lefty stuff, and I want you to have a little fun. So I want you to Can make you an engage assertion. with what I said and acknowledge the oh. fact that there is an economic tendency for big box stores and things like that to drain wealth from the communities they set up in? No. Okay, then read up on it, because you're just ignoring reality. I mean, you're, you, you might as well be like a Lysenkoist. You know, you're screaming that, that genetics don't have an influence on plant growth. It's, it, is, it is an empirical fact. There's, like I said, the fact that Walmart has had these economies of scale that have allowed it to offer lower prices and have allowed is, it to employ what, millions of people, people in the global this, south. People, no, no, you has don't, led you don't, to in, immense you don't, increases. In you living don't standards. believe this. You're just saying it. It's dogma. This is what people said decades ago. This was what people said when they didn't know any better. I don't think you actually believe this. You're just, you're just saying it. It's NPC I, behavior. I'm sorry. What do you think I do believe? Um, I don't think you. I, I think that you primarily believe in being contrarian. The first thing that you emailed me was, I disagree with your video, and when I responded with what, you said, oh, I said that before actually watching your video. I think you believe that you're smarter than me, well, and then the, smarter than the people watching, and I think that you came on here expecting to be able to own me for being a dumb commie, which I am, admittedly. Um, but the problem now is that running up against not communist arguments, but a basic liberal understanding of how the economy functions, you can do nothing but retreat back like a coward to some vaguely held presupposed beliefs that may or may not contradict reality or what I have to say. I don't think you're stupid. I think you're being a coward right now. So what have I conceded on? What am I cowardly about? Your inability to concede is the cowardice. That's the point. You're wrong. The ability to concede when wrong is a sign of strength, showing that you're confident enough to acknowledge that you've made a mistake. I mean, I'm not going to get you on like the, you know, edge case lefty stuff like, oh, abolishing stocks would be good for the economy. Obviously, that's a highly theoretical thing. But like doubling down on the Walmart thing. Come on. This is cult behavior. I don't think you actually believe this. What, did, you, did you read this somewhere? Was this an, was this a, an Amazon fulfillment uh, module that they made you watch at the warehouse? I mean, what got you on this? Again, it's I've read the literature. The scientific literature does not agree with the point you're making. What scientific literature? Um, I mentioned the book before, but it's a uh, collection of a various uh, quantitative studies. Uh, the, the, the literature on economies of scale, on corporate profits, and that sort of thing, but when you look at it, it just doesn't come to the conclusion that Walmart is this huge exploitative thing. It's the book I mentioned before is um, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. I didn't by, say, I, I got to say, the idea of trusting a book with that title is hilarious to me from from the onset um not to mention the fact that when i said you know here are all the metrics by which uh the economy has gotten worse for the average american and i listed out like you know all the things that matter your response was well the other metrics it's better i think that you probably read a book assuming the book is honest and it might not be but if you read an honest book you probably read one that had a lot to say about the abstract economic benefits of the economy of scale and uh, probably a book that advocated either implicitly or otherwise for deregulation or higher investment in corporate, uh, 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 you know, greed. Um, but I doubt you read a book that was about, say, the workers of Amazon or about the small town communities they hollowed out. So even without reading it, like just from the name alone, how America gave up on the free market, like what, 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 is, what is the the thesis then that we need to double down? Um, Ridiculous. Insane. So the thesis of the book is that America has uh, had a decline in competitiveness in the, the terms of our markets, and this has led to decreased wages. It has led to uh, increased corporate profits, and it has uh, harmed Americans in various ways. Here, somebody just linked me this. This is from Investopedia. It says exactly what I said. So my, my position is so lefty that it's on Investopedia explaining the Walmart effect. The Walmart effect is the effect that Walmart has been known to have in the communities in which it builds locations. The presence of a Walmart store can hurt the business of smaller companies and lower wages for local workers. Much of the Walmart effect can be attributed to Walmart's immense buying power. 
The Walmart effect can also affect suppliers who must drive their production costs down in order to afford to sell to Walmart. Driving their production costs down means paying their workers less, just so you know. Um, so there, like, that's, that's, that's Investopedia. I mean, email them. So, again, the, that's a problem of Walmart is a very large-scale company, and it becomes the labor monopsonist. That's a problem of a lack of competition. Okay. These, these small towns are know, just too I, small to facilitate the amount of competition well, required. Well, then, then, then that is a problem. I th it seems that on the global scale, everything is too small to properly compete with Walmart. I mean, if, if this is a degree of science, what do we need? Another planet? We need the, the Martian economic conglomerate to, to rise up and do this? No, well, ridiculous. If you look at the European Union, they have a much higher degree of competition and therefore lower corporate profits. And that's a good thing. Um, it's not just the higher degree of cooperation. It's also the fact that the government there is less explicitly pro-business than ours. And this competition is an anti... It's promoting competition between businesses is largely the anti-business thing that they do in order to get these lower profits. That's their policy of promoting competition. What? I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm... I, I told you before I get nervous. Um, well, it's it's the problem. You're you're nervous, and you're going to be increasingly nervous because the correct thing for you to do here is to concede the point entirely. That's fine, you know. I just I just I can't I can't continue to argue on uh, on the Walmart thing. I I, I feel like I'm gonna start I'm gonna start having to like crack open articles from like um like n neocon hedge fund you know think tanks to try to argue like the, the 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 basic economic shit here um this happens all over the place you know economies need to be local and democratic that's my position i'm locking it in i'm, I'm hitting it and i'm locking it in um i've hit the button and the buzzer has gone off that's my belief okay um i'm going to say neither of us are having fun with this walmart topic i would rather discuss something else too I think we can agree to disagree. And if I would, could leave my ending thesis statement, I believe that a globalized market leads to the sort of supply chain resilience and competition that allows for the low profits and that enable uh, uh, low prices that make our material standard of living higher. Look, I'm all for global markets. Um, I just want things to be controlled at the local level. Uh, and I don't think those are in any way contradictory. We have local governments, and the United States of America is one of the largest governments, uh, both in terms of power and landmass in the world. Um, you know, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not asking for anything crazy here. I just think that we need to understand that there is a balance to be had between the incredible power and influence of, um, of like globalized supply chains while also maintaining a healthy respect for the positive, uh, you know, outcome or outcomes that one can get from keeping things democratic at a local level. And competition is a farce, you know. Capitalists don't want competition, of course, and um, there is a tendency towards monopolization given enough time in any market. And it's important to understand that if we are to understand how to control them. So I would say that you're correct that capitalists don't like competition, and that's why anti-monopoly policy is part of the rules plus free markets thing that is important to getting good outcomes from capitalism. Well, you know what would make it a lot easier to get good outcomes from capitalism? What? If we abolished the economic class that seemed to have a very distinct set of interests to our own, I think that would be very beneficial in the long run when it comes to making these kinds of positive changes. So I said it before earlier in this conversation, but this, it's not a class. It's a sliding scale of how, much res how many resources you have. It's just wealth. I think that it often overlaps with wealth, but if you would prefer to think of it as a wealth issue, then you can. It's not as though I want anyone to be able to be wealthy either. 
you don't want people to be wealthy. Of course not. Wealthy in terms of disproportionate social control, the ability to be like wealthy as a meaningful class signifier. No, I think that people okay. should be comfortable. Wealth implies a level of power and influence outside of what I'm comfortable with. Okay. Um, it's a slight semantic, I guess, disagreement there. I would say that you're saying that wealth is having resources above and beyond everybody else. I just say wealth is having resources. I want everybody to be wealthy. I want people to have things. I don't want people to have disproportionate power um, in any economic or political sense. I, I agree that a more equal distribution of resources is better. But you support the institutions that lead to that inequitable distribution. Capital reinvestment, Walmart, that sort of thing. Well, no. I sub the markets plus we don't have the right rules in our capitalist system is the thing. We need markets plus better rules. We need a better system of distributing uh, uh, financial support to people in need. If you have, if you've ever applied for um, food stamps or anything like that, it's there's a tremendous amount of uh, administrative hurdles hurdles in order to get that. We make it very hard for poor people to get any amount of extra money. So if we'd had a system with much less in the administrative burden, such as some sort of universal basic income, that's a better rule. That's the markets plus rules. Uh, sure. I mean, there are other rules we could implement too, you know, uh, perhaps more radical ones if we wanted to be spicy with it. I... Uh... So when 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 you agree like this, when you say like yes, yes, we can implement more rules, I'm not seeing how you're not just getting markets plus rules equals capitalism can have good outcome. Because capitalism implies non democratic control of the means of production, which is unacceptable. I mean, you can get good outcomes under capitalism, right? But you can get good outcomes under under feudalism. I mean, under the right circumstances. The, the idea then would be to create rules that lead to the best um, long-term positive outcomes. I mean, you would want to create systems that are beneficial in the long haul. Okay, so you're saying that a system of markets plus rules can have good outcomes. Any system can have good outcomes, but I don't think we should stop at can have good outcomes. I think we should try to improve them as much as is possible. Okay, yes. People being happy is good. People having better lives is good. But I fundamentally believe that the market is part of what enables people to have those better lives. Yeah, sure. Then have uh, market democracy. You never even stated anything close to an opposition to worker cooperatives. You just kept asking, um, well, what if this? Yeah. Well, what if that? Why not something else? Which, like, so, why, why the aversion? As I understood it, um, my objection to uh, worker democracy is based on the equity argument. So when you said you don't want any equity considered, I um, did not know how to proceed. So normally when people say they want worker democracy, worker co-ops, they w want the workers to own the means of production in order to get the financial uh, the winnings of that. But my argument is that um, when you own a single company like that, um, that's putting all of your eggs in one basket. And with a more diverse set of companies you own via a 401k or something, the sample standard deviation will tend to um, decrease as the uh, number increases. Most so people you get don't a, own anything with regards to that. Most equity. people, the median net worth is $121,000. I mean, equity. Well, Yes, we should have better. Most people have a 401k. Most? I'd be very, I don't know how many people it is, but I'd be very surprised if it was most. Um, also, you know that the, the, hold on, median net worth US citizen. Yeah. Okay, so this is net worth of an average family, not citizen, but okay, fine, household then. Um, median debt household. The net worth already accounts for the debt because it's net worth. Just a moment.
average total consumer household debt in 2022 was 101,915. If they, ha if the median person has enough net worth to cover their debt, why don't they just instantly pay their debt? Um, because they can make higher returns by investing that money or oh buying God, things that they want instead of paying off that debt. You're so un like unreal brained. This is, wait, hold on. I recognize that argument. Are you a dgg -er? What's DGG? Ah, damn it. This, that sounded, ah, oh, dead on. Um, the, um, the idea that like people are holding on to a ton of credit card debt because they can leverage the, like, yeah, the $25,000 in credit card debt or whatever. It's like, ah, because they're trying to leverage that so they can buy other things. Using, um, uh, uh, median worth as an indicator of how much money people potentially have to spend in an emergency situation is ridiculous and in a world where most Americans don't have anything saved for retirement. The, the idea that that like indicator is refers to what you think it's referring to is just not true. It's not true. People are so, in a worse position than you seem to think they are. I, I'm, I feel like I'm repeating myself that the median net worth is 121. That, that means 50% of Americans have more than that. But you, you ju I don't think you know what that number means. Yes, at median net worth, their assets over their debts. Okay, and con considering the fact that their assets can include like their car or their house, and the fact that uh, that the the again the median debt is over a hundred thousand, the fact that that you the idea that like all of that is being leveraged, you know, that apart from whatever is their their mortgage or uh, or or car debt or whatever that like credit card debt is just being held and not paid off as some kind of like flippant economic mismanagement? Um, so I'm going to say it's overwhelmingly not credit card debt that people hold on to for a long time. It's, you know, a student loan debt has like, what, 7% interest? People can make high, people can focus on buying the things that they want. People can focus on uh, investing that money instead of paying de debt off immediately. That's not, this is not how anything works. It's exactly how it works. It is people, at, no, it's not. No, it's not. Not in reality. People, people use debt to smooth consumption over time. I feel. I feel like I'm talking to a person who's learned everything about a subject from the like the 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 subreddit for it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, debt." Okay, the average American apparently has something in the ballpark of six thousand dollars in credit card debt. What do you do you think that they're leveraging that credit card debt to spend to invest? So considering credit card debt interest is quite high, what uh, what returns do you think they're making on the investment opportunities that they're holding on to with that credit card debt? They bought things they wanted with that. Well, the return is the happiness they get from buying the things they want. Why do they have the debt if their net worth on average would allow them to cover it? Because they decided it was a better option. And again, that's a net worth that's come that's factoring in the debt. Yeah. Okay. So why? So if they have additional net worth considering the debt, then why don't they just pay off the credit card debt? Because they didn't want to sell the things they already had in order to acquire more things. Okay. So they're willing to deal with uh, insane monthly credit card interest rate, which of course vary, you know, significantly, but they're quite high on average. F for for what? Again, for the happiness of buying the things that they want. No, no, no. But like, why aren't they paying it off with their significant net worth? I, I've answered this once before, but it's because they would rather not sell the things they already have in order to acquire more things. Okay, so that net worth then is so inaccessible, so non-liquid, that they are willing to incur the interest payments of thousands of dollars of credit card debt in order to hold on to it. It's not necessarily a matter of liquidity. It's just what their preferences are. Okay. If their preferences are leading to thousands of dollars of credit card debt that they're not paying off, do you think we might have an economic issue here? I've already said that there should be a more equitable system of resource distribution. What, what does that have to do with, with what I'm talking about right now? Resources distribution is income. Okay, what does that have to do with what I'm talking about right now? People should have the money in order to pay off the, th the debt that they have. Okay, people should have more money. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that we agree on that. 
So then with that, what is your contention of on, on this topic? On which topic? On why people choose to maintain that debt. Because earlier you were using net worth as an indicator that they could choose to pay for an emergency if they wanted to. And but if they could. People, but if people are field, so if a person says, I can't afford X, do you think that you could then say, oh, wrong, you could sell your kidney? Do you, do you think that's like a good rebuttal? Like they said, that idiot, I bet they haven't even read Economics 101 on Reddit, r slash Economics 101. You could sell your kidney. Do you think that's like a good rebuttal? Or do you think there might be a problem with that? So you're going to these extremes. Answer the because... question. You're going to these answer extremes. The qu no. Answer. No, no. Answer the question. Okay, okay, Do okay, you okay, think it would be a good rebuttal if they're like, oh, I totally, I can't afford this debt. I, oh, I got in a car accident, a fender bender. I can't afford this repair bill. And then you're like, you've got two kidneys. Do you, that you're wrong, idiot. Do you think that would be like a good rebuttal? Would that be a correct answer on your part? People don't have to sell their kidneys. Do you answer the question. The answer is that the question is inapplicable to the answer. The question. People having to sell their kidneys is bad. Okay. What about people having to sell a random assortment of household objects in order to pay off? the cost of an emergency. That is significantly less bad. Okay. Can you explain to me again, really quickly, with a yes or no answer, would you be correct in that response? In what response? Saying the person was an idiot because they have two kidneys and they can sell one. I already said that that was bad. Oh, I didn't ask you if it was bad. I asked you if that was a valid response. No. Okay. Now, what if a person said, oh, I can't afford this. I, I like li literally can't afford this. And you say, hold on, that bill is for $1,000. However, uh, you have at least $1,200 worth of non-essential furniture that you could sell. So you're wrong. You can afford it. Do you think that is a correct answer? Yes. Okay. So this is the, the fundamental problem here. All right. It's that when people say, I can't afford X, what they mean is, I can't afford it with the liquid currency that I possess, not I can't afford it if I'm willing to pull out all the stops and sell these non-essential things that I already own. Normally, if a person is in a position where they have to sell possessions of theirs to make ends meet, that itself is an emergency. The fact that you were willing to use median net worth as an indicator of whether or not people can afford to um, pay for their emergencies is the problem. Because can afford to, in this context, makes about as much sense to me as arguing, again, well, haha, you have two kidneys. We're not really addressing whether or not they can afford it. It's, it's a meaningless definition of whether or not we can afford it. You know, you could, you could sell your body. Well, sure, I guess anyone could, but that doesn't really answer the question, does it? It makes it hard for me to believe you care about improving people's standards of living when the definitions that you use and the phrases that you jump to are so implicitly dismissive. So I would say that you've, by definition, assumed that this person is in an emergency. I think it is good that people can have enough resources where they don't need to take out debt in order to have the solution to that emergency. Okay. So then what I said earlier about most Americans not being able to afford an emergency is true. I don't know why we argued on that then if that's the case. But they can. Again, people aren't selling their kidney. People aren't selling their furniture. People, the hey, median person. You just said taking on credit. No, no, stop using net worth. It's not relevant. If, we're, if we've agreed that we shouldn't be taking on debt or selling furniture when we talk about whether or not someone can afford something, net worth is no longer the stat we should be looking at we should be looking at how much money they have in the bank because that is the only possible thing they could use to pay for an emergency that isn't going on credit or selling things to make the debt. It's 
it's nobody stores their money in the form of money in the bank. Well, I, I ju okay. Just out of curiosity, where do you think the average American stores the excess money they have? Uh, mostly in their house that they own. You think the average American owns a house and that they store their excess money in cash in their house? No, not in a pile of cash. I mean, the value of their home. Okay, we're ta Okay, we just said that we're not talking about selling. We're talking about money they have on hand. The house that you own is the most non-liquid possible form of wealth that you can have. It, it, like, there is no less liquid form of wealth. It is, it is a hardened diamond of wealth. And so we, I... so No, no, no. Because we were okay. talking about liquid currency with which to pay for an emergency. Why did you just go to a house when I said liquid currency, when that is the most not liquid currency? Because liquid currency is an irrelevant metric. It is the only relevant metric when we are talking about being able to pay for an emergency without selling things or without going on credit. That is the only other place you can have. You have to have liquid currency. If you're not selling something, it has to be liquid currency. But the things people would on average sell aren't their kidneys. It isn't their furniture. It's oh my some God. stocks they own. Oh my God. They have a retirement account we that they can break into. The re a retirement account. You think yes, the average... You, you realize you can't just break into a 401k, right? Yeah, you can. Sure, you pay a higher tax rate when you uh, get your income out of it, but you can. You, so you're saying a person, hold on, hefty penalties and tax consequences, finding to have the retirement funds are, okay, so when a person says, I can't afford this, you're, you think it's a valid answer to say, oh, you could just withdraw from your 401k at a heavy penalty. Sorry, I was eating. Yes. Only 60 million Americans have a 401k, by the way. That's less than 20% of Americans. That seems incorrect. For how, who doesn't have a 401k? Lots of people. You don't have one. I have one. You have one? Where do you work? Amazon. Okay. Um, do all Amazon fulfillment workers get 401k plans? Uh, yeah. Well, that's nice. It's an employer sponsored too. So the first um, 2% of my wage that I um, uh, put in towards it, Amazon also matches that. They give me free money if I contribute to my 401k. Oh, at your uh, young age, if you had an emergency you couldn't afford, otherwise, I don't think you'd have very much to tap into here. Well, I own $40,000 in stocks, so oh, I have plenty I can... Oh my fucking god, of course you do. And where'd you get that $40,000 from? From working at Amazon. Okay. And uh, where do you live, out of curiosity? Uh, You're, Chicago. You... No, 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 no. Where do you live? What do you mean? Who do you live with? On my own. You live on your own in Chicago at 25, and you have $40,000, not, not just liquid, but that you have invested. Yes. I, I don't understand what you're surprised about. I know. This is, guys, it's like the, um, it's like, it's like the every account that you think, right? Where it's like, here's 10 easy steps in getting involved in real estate management. It's like, where's the, where's the $500 million donation from your parents, you know? Um, yeah, working from Amazon too. Uh, yeah. Um, do you, do you know what the average Amazon worker makes? Why don't you tell me? How long have you uh, worked there, by the way? I have worked there since 2017. Since 2017. So that's, um, Gotcha. How much? Uh, like six years. Yeah. So how um, much? I currently make about twenty-three dollars an hour. I don't think that's the average amount made in an Amazon fulfillment center. It's a little bit aver it, high, above average because um, the average is pulled down by a bunch of people who work there for six months, and they, you know, obviously start at the starting wage, which is below the average. Um. That that's not that. That's just what the wage would be. If you work at a place for six months, that would be the wage. That's not the average well, wage then. But that's, yes, I said that's below the average. The average Amazon Fulfillment Associate hourly pay in Seattle is approximately $19 an hour, which is 25% above the national average. 
Chicago must pay um, good money. It's minimum wage in Chicago. Um, thirteen twenty-five, I think. It's fifteen here in Seattle. Average hourly pay from ZipRecruiter is sixteen fifty an hour at a warehouse job in Chicago. Well, it's difficult to trust those sites anyway. Well, regardless of what I I think you're lying, by the way. But regardless of 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 what you're either lying or you're so friendless that you have literally nothing to spend your money on other than reinvestment. But um, the average American. Uh, does not have 40k in stocks, and the average American uh, does not have a 401k to pull from, and the average American cannot afford an emergency uh, of just around $1,000, and that does not change if they have a 401k they could uh, suffer heavy penalties in withdrawing from. When you say you can't afford something, that means you don't have the liquid cash to pay for it. If you have to sell something to pay for it, that means you couldn't afford it and you had to make a sacrifice to pay it. And I don't think people should be making sacrifices in order to meet daily demands, needs, debts, and emergencies. People make trade-offs all of the time. Yes, they do. Everyone has. It's a meaningless answer. It doesn't speak to anything that I have said. I, no, I, I notice, don't notice how you claim to be in favor of social changes that improve the living situation for the average person, but then every time anything specific comes up, you sound like a like a, a fucking, um, you know, like a top hat wearing pig capitalist sneering at the worker for demanding more. You seem very contemptuous of people who you think are below you. What, what have I said that sounds contemptuous? Pray this, tell. This entire conversation is dripping with the vibe that you think you're smarter than the average worker and that their problems are self-inflicted due to poor economic management. Well, I don't think it's poor economic management. They just have different priorities than me. Priorities that lead to them being in debt and working multiple jobs and not being able to afford things and being um, forced out of their houses and so on and so on. Do you think their priorities might just be worse living situations? No, I believe in many ways their priorities are better living situations. Because th th it's, it's, I'm not applying any moral judgment to this. Not applying any moral judgment, but... And you, and you claim to want better standards of living for these workers, you know, but at the same time, um, all these people could just afford, you know, to solve their problems, to not work that hard, to not have to work multiple jobs, to not have to move out of the houses in which they live. And they're just making, what, poor decisions which lead to it? No, it's not making poor decisions. It's just making different decisions. Different decisions which lead to them being evicted and having high credit card debt. Sometimes, yes. So this is what I mean by contemptuous, and it's a what, what, poor job what's at masking. What's with the contempt? Too. I'm not understanding. I, I agree. What is with the contempt? What the? F no, what is contemptuous about that? You you have a laughably poor understanding of the plight of the average American worker, and in spite of, in the case of some of the specific stuff that we've discussed, empirical and uh, uh widely accepted evidence of things being skewed against them, you have instead obstinately refuse to acknowledge the extent to which this game is rigged on any level like you claim to want better conditions but uh, uh, it's it's all just like skill issue skill issue skill issue with you i i believe that that's an inaccurate characterization because i've said things like the lack of competition in american economy leads it's, to lower wages and higher corporate profits you're doing it D again that, that's a systemic issue that I would like to see yeah, solved. It's a, well, it's a systemic issue on which you're wrong. The idea that these problems can be fixed with higher competition is the line that uh, politicians have been running for literal decades. Pro-competition, pro-competition, pro-competition. And what is it, what's happened? Nothing. Like, this is the line that's led to all the harm that we're talking about here. The American populace right now has the highest standard of living they ever have had. The what? The American populace right now has the highest standard of living that they ever have By had. By what standard? By the Human Development Index. Okay, and what metrics are they looking at? Uh, they're looking at education. They're looking at uh, median uh, wealth. They're looking at various things like this. And yet... S for some reason, health, you know, health outcomes, they're looking at all of these things. And yet, for some reason, uh, the average life expectancy right now is lowering. 
um, people are having a harder time finding gainful employment. Underemployment rates have skyrocketed. Uh, people are having a harder and harder time affording rent. This is what I mean by contempt. There are I, plenty I of contempt. There are plenty of metrics that you can look at. Economic journals you can read. I'm not asking you to be all lovey-dovey, feely-feely here, okay? There's plenty you can read, hard data you can read to indicate uh, that things are getting, in many cases, worse. But you have two contradictory values that you're trying to push here. On one hand, you claim to want things that are better for the average worker by pushing for more economic competition, because that's been so effective um, in terms of dealing with these issues. You know, we've definitely done a lot to fight the inevitable monopolization of our economy. But then, uh, at every level, you patronize and condescend the experience of the average worker. You say you want things better? Why? According to wor your worldview, they're better than ever. And all the mistakes they make that lead to them being evicted or having credit card debt or not being able to afford an emergency, well, they just, well, that's it's just poor economic management on their part. Oh, sorry, watch, watch, different watch. priorities, ones that yeah. lead to them in poverty. Uh, so there are a couple of things that can simultaneously be true. Hmm? Things are better now than they ever have been, so, but wait, they're how... not good enough. Okay, okay, that's that's great to know. Um, you do know, of course, that the plight of the worker has never been meaningfully improved by people whose first ideological priority is defense of the status quo. You argued that I hated the global poor because I don't think that we should be defending Walmart because they support sweatshops in China. I don't think you have any serious positions outside of feeling smarter than the people you talk to. Something in which you've spectacularly failed in this conversation, if your goal was to appease any audience, by the way. If you want Gosh. to have real positions on these issues, like actual genuine positions, you have to work out the inconsistencies because you cannot simultaneously say that you care about improving the standard of living for the average worker and then also talk about how not only are things better than they have ever been, which is wrong, um, but also, uh, you know, all of these articles explaining how things have gotten worse, well, they're just uh, hand wringing. I've, I, I don't appreciate this hostility that you're directing towards me. The I American think worker doesn't appreciate the contempt and derision you've directed at them. What have what, I don't? What do you mean contempt? I haven't. I, I, I. Then you never will, and that's fine. But okay, can I say one closing statement? If you're going to be like this, sure. There are barriers to. The productions of goods and services, such as zoning laws that prevent housing construction, that lead to specific bad outcomes, such as people not being able to afford housing. There are also barriers to immigration that prevent the sort of increases to wealth that would hugely benefit everybody, but especially the global poorest. And that's... Uh, Sorry, I'm nervous again. The eyes of the American working class are on the back of your neck. <laughs> um, None of this will ever mean anything. If you continue to tout the line that things are better than they ever have been, a empirically and provably false statement, then there is no reason to believe any subsequent qualification. It's Steven Pinker shit, you know? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's ludicrous. I think that, I, 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 I mean, you do... You do know you're being motivated primarily by a feeling of superiority to the people you're talking about, right? No, I'm not. I've seen so much of it, and I can identify it really easily when talking to people, I think, more so than almost anything. Um, I'm not denying the fact that you're intelligent, but like so much of what you've said and so much of the rhetoric that you engage in is picture perfect. It's um, stereotypical. And assuming you're telling the truth about, uh, you know, uh, the money you've saved and what have you, I think, if anything, it's more indicative. You're a person who, I assume, has been very fastidious and thoughtful in how you've managed your finances and your affairs. You certainly seem fastidious in our conversations, so that seems applicable, I think. Um, and you have, you have a, a, you know, a high uh, opinion of your own intelligence, which, you know, plenty of people, I do, you know, so that's not like a huge demarcation. It's not hugely negative. But um, people in that position are, I mean, we have a term for them. It's embarrassed millionaires, right? 
temporarily embarrassed millionaires. The idea of people who believe um, very much in the system on a fundamental level, who maybe have some sort of outside or specific intellectual critiques, um, but the one thing they can't abide is the idea that the system is not meritocratic. And I don't think you'd say it's meritocratic, but everything you've said comes across as the defenses of a person who wants people to believe it's meritocratic. I mean, arguing over median net wealth as a determiner of whether people can, can afford to pay for it, like stuff like that, can, you know? Can I interject? Sure. Um, I, I would like to specifically state that I don't believe the system is currently anywhere near fully meritocratic. But I just said there you are... didn't say that. I, I, I'm just saying, well, you've also said that everything I've said seems like that is something I would believe. And I want to make it clear to you that I'm not this evil monster. I, I, I recognize that there are some systemic issues. Can you understand how, from my perspective, somebody like you would be, um, even assuming you're completely genuine, would be completely evil? That, that you would be like a demon to somebody like me because a lot because it seems like your reflexive priority on most every issue we've discussed is to take a line that is at the very least reminiscent of like hard line neocon the poor it, it, attitudes like that's the reflexive thing that it's is consensual the coconut island analogy that hey whoa the average american can afford this you know huh uh take a look at this um take a look at this like chart on like net median wealth or whatever like oh man there's some stuff you can sell if you got uh, an emergency i wouldn't even think to say that is the thing for me if if somebody was talking to me about like the state of uh, economically like the state of affairs that we live in and 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 someone was talking about how bad it had gotten my response would not be like i wouldn't even think to say um well here's needy uh, net like median wealth there must be something you can sell but you went to that instantly because I think that like your first priority is like the skill issue thing, because you've skilled your way into a pretty decent economic system uh, or, or state of affairs with the money that you've saved up. So why shouldn't or why can't other people? It makes what you say sound contemptuous to the working class because it sounds like you're, oh, they have different priorities, but it reads like in, in, in reality, you, you think they have stupid priorities. You think that they're stupid. They've mismanaged their affairs in a way that you haven't you did well. You were smart. You saved the money. You did what everyone said you should do. You probably lived with your parents for a while while saving up money. You invested it smartly. You did what I read on Reddit that I should do back when I was young. You know, you, 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 you stay there for two or three years with your parents and you save up money, you pay down your student debt, and you go right ahead. And, you know, I'm not saying it's bad advice or that a lot more people couldn't do it, but that's kind of been your response to a lot of this, right? Like skill issue, skill issue, skill issue, just in different words. So when you say it like that, I can understand how that is the impression that you might've gotten from some of the things I say. And I can understand how jumping to, yes, you can sell things might be seen as like flippant and uh, what's the adjective? Um, well, like you said, demonic. Um, but when I was thinking of that, I was thinking of, you know, it's not saying sell your furniture. It's not saying sell your kidney. It's the average person has more than that, that they can sell. They can sell something fairly non-consequential to their life. But even, even what you're doing right now, still, why would they have to sell anything? If they have no liquid cash on hand to spend on the emergency, that's the issue being discussed. Like, the last, see, you, you've done it again, right? You're saying like, okay, well, you know, I'm not saying it's a skill issue, but it's a skill issue. But that's- Can I interject? The, it's, the, if, if it's not liquid cash, that's the problem. Can I interject? Yes. I don't have any liquid cash on hand. Because I kept, I keep it in stocks. The average American does not have no liquid cash on hand because they keep it in stocks. And also, you should really I, keep liquid cash on hand. You really don't want to have to like quickly sell in case you get into a car accident. Okay, but so you say that 
I have this negative view of other people because they don't have liquid cash, but I'm in that exact position. No, I'm not moralizing. You're doing it again, though. You just equivocated them not having liquid cash because they're broke and you not having liquid cash because you're playing like Wall Street gold games uh, on, on the exchange. Like that's, you know, damn well, that is not why the average American who doesn't have liquid cash doesn't have liquid cash. It's because they're broke. Yes, some people are in really unfair positions. Some people have not had a fair shot in life. Some people have been victims of racism. Some people have been, uh, they're, they're undocumented and so they can't get that. But the things, the reforms I want, I want an open border so that undocumented people can uh, work in the United States freely. I want a less racist society. I want to eliminate the, the barriers that have put in, put in place by society to prevent people from getting into my position. Yeah, but I, I think the thing is, is that when you say this stuff, I think you're doing it from more of a libertarian perspective. You didn't buy into liberal economic critique either. I, I think that like, if, like you say you want more competition, but then you defend the ultra monopoly Walmart, you know? You say you want better working standards for the American poor, but then you say things are better than they ever have been, which is demonstrably false. You say you don't want to come across a demon, but then when it comes to talking about people's debt, you sound like a Fox News article saying, debt? Well, why don't they just sell their iPhones? You know, it's the, the, it, at every personal level, you, uh, you, you leap towards something that indicates great personal bias. Um, even if intellectually you defend all these things, like the only thing that I know for sure is that the consequence of your political beliefs, given the fact that you defend Walmart and can't accept the effect it's had on local economies, is that you're fine with monopolies. By more competition, what you mean is less government barriers to corporate power. When you talk about- No, 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 no. When I say more competition, I mean anti-monopoly policy. I mean- it Then why apart. defend Walmart? Because Walmart isn't an example of a firm that has had those effects. Look at their profit rate. It's very low. What? When a monopoly is having a harmful effect, it leads to higher corporate profits, higher prices. What? It, no, it, it, no, that's not necessarily true. A, a, a monopoly can have incredibly harmful effects, even if it's doing poorly. I, I, I... I disagree. No, 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 you can't disagree on that. The, the pro Nobody who complains about monopolies is like, ah, well, the problem with monopolies is when they make too much money, they're dangerous. No, the problem with monopolies is that they drain local economies, they lock out competitors, they have like back-end negotiations they can do to live. Like, th this is what I mean. You don't want things to be better for the American worker. You want a specific set of economic policies that you've adopted in all likelihood, because you think holding them makes you smarter than the average person. And, um, and, 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 and your policies would be ruinous. When you talk about the poor, you sound like a sniveling neocon, a 75-year-old white man on Fox News. And when you, when you do this, well, I actually want systemic change, the systemic change you want would make things worse. So I want to say, for example, it's literally just specifically Walmart if if you asked me about United Airlines, I would say that they should be broken up. If you asked me about Apple or Google or Amazon, I would say that they should be broken Why up. Why United Airlines? Uh, their profit margins are even lower than Walmart's. United Airlines uh, has made a fundamental in the last couple, 30 years, I think. Um, they have a uh, consolidated industry in a way that has uh, harmed the consumer experience of of using the airline and they have increased their profits. Okay, but airlines operate at an incredibly narrow margin because of all the expenses that go into that kind of industry. If we're well, talking it, about these it, margins- It's a narrow margin, but it's higher than it should be given the nature of that industry. It should be even lower. How, this seems like a very arbitrary determination. You know that it, a monopoly can be bad even if it's not making money, right? Sure. But what? What about that? Well, that would be the category Walmart falls into. Well, Walmart makes money. Yeah, but well, that's my point. You were the one that said they didn't make enough money to categorize themselves as a monopoly. Th th 
they they are a, they they're, they they make a billion dollars in revenue, but on a very high amount of expense. But the, but this this is irrelevant to whether or not monopolies are harmful. Where have where have they used their monopolistic market share in order to gain price setting power? I don't care about price setting. What this is what I mean. It's it's no none of this this you are so locked into your um in into the framework by which you analyze this the problems with their monopolization are present everywhere I mean to to start the fact that they are able to use the economy of scale to drive prices far lower which means that the um suppliers have to pay their workers less and it means that they um pay their workers less. I mean, a ton of Walmart workers are subsidized by welfare. And the fact that it means that they can um, lower prices beyond what local industry can do, which drives them out of business. Like, all of these are problems associated with price setting. But those aren't the only ones. Like, monopolies are just bad in general. So when you talk about their uh, ability to set workers' wages, that's a monopsony, not a monopoly. I, I agree that Walmart very often has monopsony power that's problematic. Okay. Uh, maybe you, I'm too, okay. Maybe, maybe you I'm realize, too focused on the specific definitions of words. You realize that monopolies develop monopsonies, right? Like the more omnipresent any given firm is in an industry, either locally or like in terms of broad availability, these are like well, this. This is this is total semantics. You know perfectly well that when we're talking about monopolies here, we are talking about um, uh, industry giants. That have grown, uh, that have grown too powerful uh, and control too much of the market share. I, I, I don't presume that a company being big is bad in and of itself. It is what they do with that bigness. The bigness is something they will always use to do the bad thing. Not if there's a sufficient rules-based order. To the market which has been doing wonderfully so far in an age of unprecedented monopolization and i've said that i want the rules to change that okay but you said it wouldn't apply to walmart so why would i care about the changes that you want if you don't think walmart one of the main groups that should be broken up um should benefit from them it... <laughs> like clearly your definition of what needs to be stopped in a monopoly is very different from mine I think that like your if your rules if applied would lead to a situation just as nightmarish for the average worker and then I would point that out and you would go like oh but look according to this one chart you know their their overall purchasing power is increased so things are actually better than ever you know and then you would like conveniently ignore the fact that more and more people are working uh like multiple gig jobs just in order to survive and then they would all go back to their workplaces and then they would argue for workplace democracy and you'd be like what for just lobby the government. And then the government is completely controlled by corporate lobbies, like it always has been. Flash, I'm seeing that we're probably not going to come to an agreement on what things mean. But I want to leave on the note of what we agreed on. I want to keep this amicable because I don't hate you. But we, we agreed on carbon taxation. We agreed on you have a better memory than i do i'm sorry i don't but... have a great memory would you agree at least that amazon should be broken up uh yes okay um anyway um trans rights Tra trans rights but also please don't stomp on any poor earnest working class people on your way to the stock exchange to pick up your uh, I... revenue okay no guarantees all right, take care. <laughs> See ya. See ya. We can fix her. You're only saying that because they implied they're trans. Um, uh, um, I, I, um, oh man, that was, yeah, what about it? Yeah, okay. All right, there you go. She's actually a working class hero. What was that? Dude, f oh my God. Some people, okay. Some people, some people are going to say that I was mean for that. And I, I mean, I don't write her or anyone off. I, I, I don't want to, and I don't try to. And obviously like, I mean to people, but like, okay, I stand by that. The problem is that like so much of, 
so so much of when you're trying to talk about these issues, a lot of it comes down to what the implicit values a person seems to demonstrate are. And I just could not help but read. And I hope a lot of you understand what I was what I was seeing there. Um I, I hope a lot of you can read that a lot of what she said came across to me as extremely contemptuous of poor people. How even though in the abstract, a lot of the stuff that she said seemed fine and sensible and liberal, at least enough, at every opportunity, there would be this like this this giveaway. And you have to look for stuff like that because there are a ton of like Fox News articles that are like, you know, um, oh, you know, uh, the the people say that the working class are struggling, but it turns out 90% of poor homes have a refrigerator. You guys remember that famous article? And then it's like, and, and then you look at that and it's like, okay, the article is correct. 90% of American homes do have a refrigerator. I can't argue with that. But what is this article really saying? And what the article is really saying, it's not, they're not really saying that the average American has a fridge because that's not very interesting information. What they're really saying is that the average American is being a whiny baby when they talk about the consequence of poverty. Oh, you say you're poor, but you know, you look at all this stuff you've got, you know? And that's the vibe I got from so much of the shit that she said. And she seems really intelligent, too. She seems really intelligent, too. So the vibe that I get is that she is... Okay, at first I thought maybe she's like a mommy and daddy money kind of person, right? But... Oh, whoops. You know, maybe she's like a mommy or daddy money kind of person. But I think it's more complicated than that. I think that she might actually be quite accomplished and intelligent in how she manages her finances. And as a, as a consequence of that, right, she has a um, strong uh, emotional investment in, yeah, a kind of survivorship bias to, to an extent, which affects her perception. Because I bet you that at some point, oh, I guarantee this. Oh, my God. I know for a fact. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing with my third eye. I'm divining the past and I can see it. I guarantee you that she has had friends who got into financial trouble for their own, like, their own fuck-ups. Like, I guarantee you she's had friends who have gotten themselves into economic trouble and then, because they made stupid decisions, and in her head, she was like, well, what the fuck? Like, is that, is that really anyone's fault but your own? And, the, and, and, and maybe those friends really did fuck up, and I get that, and I, I, I get that. I understand that, but I feel like maybe she projects that out because she just could not acknowledge, like, this is why, this is why I was mean. She could not acknowledge the idea of Americans suffering through poverty and engage with it. She distracted from it at every opportunity. Like, whenever I would talk about, like, like the average person not having much liquid income, and she was like, well, I don't have any, because I have 40k in stocks. Or, like, the average American's paycheck, paycheck. It's like, well, the average American can't be paycheck, paycheck. Look at this median net worth. It seemed like she wanted to really avoid dealing with the idea of a poor American. Like, she, di she didn't want to engage with that, because there's something about that that is like discomforting. D does everyone understand why I'm saying what I'm saying right now? I I feel like that's 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 something that was like influencing how she talked about these issues in a negative way. Um, I don't think she like hates poor people, but I think it's very telling that she could not deal with that reality. Like, I mean, hold on. I, I didn't want to, like, run through a bunch and just, like, list at her, but, like, holy shit. Um, um, okay. How many Americans uh, food insecure? 34 million Americans are food insecure. A tenth of the population have, have trouble, like, getting like knowing where their food's going to come from or whether or not like for sure they'll be able to get it or like there's there's difficulty or anxiety in getting it um so yeah some are some are in here now watching um yeah over 33.8 million Americans lived in households that struggled against food insecurity or lack of access to affordable nutritious diet like food isn't like a guaranteed thing for them like 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 food insecure means that availability and access of food is to them not a given 
Like, for most Americans, maybe they're suffering with money issues, but you always know you can get your food if you need it. You can get your rice and beans, whatever. But 34 million Americans, you know, don't fit in that category. And then you have how many Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, and it's, okay, 69% nice living in, uh, of Americans living in urban areas. Two-thirds are living paycheck to paycheck. Um... And, and I feel like if I had said this to her, she would have been like, okay, well, they say they're living paycheck to paycheck, but if things really came down to it, you know, they could always, like, I don't know, sell a nice lamp they have or whatever. And it's like, that's not... It's, it's always 60% plus. It's always, like, around 60% living paycheck to paycheck. And then, and then she said, like, oh, well, they actually can afford an emergency, you know? They actually can afford an emergency because they could put it on credit. And it's like, what do you think afford means? By definition, if you have to put something on credit in order to buy it or pay for it, you can't afford it. That's the point of credit. You all understand You all understand what I'm talking about, right? I man, I didn't want to be me because again, I don't know if she's aware of the extent to which this all you weren't mean, dude. Um, maybe not. I'm getting my ass kicked over here, dude. Master mode, hard mode in Terraria does not... F Jesus Christ, you die in like two hits to anything. Anyway, yeah, hopefully hopefully you all understand. I, I think it's it's very it's very important, I think, to, to call out those like vibes issues, you know, where it's like, oh, well, on the numbers we agree... I think it said a lot that she wasn't able to acknowledge that protectionist policies were economically beneficial to South Korea as well. I think that's really indicative. The, the re so protectionism for a country like America is not a good idea. And the reason for that is because America is already an economic giant, and we don't really need to protect our local industry for any reason other than, I don't know, to be really nice to our local industry and our local industry, okay? They're fine. But if you're a poor country, or more likely in the case of South Korea, a poor country with the potential for a lot of industrialization, and you want to be like really big into car manufacturing, like let's say, let's say you're South Korea and it's 1976 or something, and your country is currently a fascist dictatorship, and you really, really, really want to be like a manufacturing giant. Well, here's the thing, okay? You can be producing American cars. Have fun, bucko. Have fun in your sweatshops. But what they thought over in South Korea was, okay, hold on, look, I think if we really gun for it, we can make a good car. We can make good local industry, but we can't do it if we open up our markets and every local South Korean just runs out and buys an American car that gets imported. If they just run out and buy a Ford or whatever, how the fuck is our own car industry going to grow? So what they do is they heavily tax or otherwise disincentivize um, imports. And uh, 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 they subsidize and promote their own industry. And as a consequence of that, um, South Korea was able to do some pretty economically miraculous shit, you know? Like, definitely a lot better than what, like, China has done with regards to local, uh, you know, export power. And South Korea is still a major exporter, as, as I understand it correctly. Um, Singapore did this. Like, this, this, is, this is pretty commonly known. I don't know why she would disagree with that. Troll? I don't think she was a troll. I, I don't think she's a troll. I still don't understand her love of Walmart. I don't think she loves Walmart. I just think that her def... I think that... Okay. I think that she's autistic, and I stand by that. And I think that she thinks of the economy as a complex little, you know, uh, watch. Like a, like a little mechanical device. And that if you're very smart, and if you're very thoughtful, you can build out that machine in a way that's very productive. But her standards of productivity are different from mine because obviously productivity on its own isn't enough for me, right? Like I want economic equality and, and worker rights and stuff. So she's trying to maximize for definitions of productivity that don't really factor in equitability or in all likelihood, she's one of those like let the government, you know, like let the government tax the business proceeds kind of people where, you know, like, okay. If you think Walmart's doing something bad, then maybe you should like, you know, let them do really economically productive stuff, but then you can uh, turn around and tax them. But the problem, and this is always the problem, is that leaving aside the fact that that never works, it never works. You're always like, oh, dude, 
let's let the corporations run rampant. We'll get our money back from them when we tax them. And it never works, does it? You know why? Because of the bourgeoisie. Huh? Because if you let there be a super small concentrated group of ultra powerful wealthy people, they're not going to let you tax that money away, are they? And that's always how it's been, you know? Trickle down economics, uh, or, or, or even with taxing it, it's like, you know, oh, they fight it on every level because they have no sense of social responsibility because of course they don't. You think therapy would help her? I, I, I don't think that's responsible messaging. I don't think there was anything psychologically wrong with the chick that we just talked to at all i think that the, i i think that um I, I i think that she has a specific set of definitions in mind when she talks about like economic good she's maximizing for those and she's uncomfortable with any framework that goes outside of whatever maximizes those Vosh, she was just ignorant. You calling her a demon is on the level of calling her mentally unwell for her bad positions. No, no, no. I said, and I stand by this, can you understand why what you're saying would make you come across like a demon to us? And I, and I, stand, I stand by that. Um, because the stuff she was saying was not distinguishable from a lot of like really overt anti-poor, you know, messaging.